motion for August 6th? Yes. All right. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. That's unanimous. We'll move the 27th to the next meeting. Item number five on the agenda, the Planning Board will conduct a public hearing to receive comment on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Zoning Ordinance, to amend Section 6, Definitions, Affordable Housing. Jamel, would you like to introduce this Chase. one, or Mr. Chase? Uh, sure. So this is actually coming to the Board by way of the Housing Alliance, and I don't believe there's anyone here from the Alliance to speak this, so I'll do my best to give you the presentation as I can. Um, the conversation at the Housing Alliance really spurred from some ongoing discussions they had with developers who were trying to secure uh, affordable housing as part of the uh, affordable housing density program that the town has and really experiencing some challenges as we sort of try to have the rubber hit the road, so to speak. Um, and really some of the challenges uh, were particularly identified, um, particularly for um, identifying how units are priced and what the price moving forward would be, particularly for future landowners who aren't developers or uh, providers um, who may not necessar necessarily sort of be professionals in the realm of affordable housing, but just future homeowners who purchase the house. So um, with that sort of as the sort of table setting, if you will, the committee set about trying to come up with a program that incorporated both um, their sort of some accompanying worksheets that they're working on that help to identify, uh, set the housing uh, affordability prices and as well as the income variabilities. But in that, there's uh, the definition changes that we're also discussing tonight. So with that, the uh, Alliance is proposing some modifications to um, the definition of affordable housing. One is a couple of changes under the ownership provisions. Um, they would seek to establish a set family size, a family of four, uh, for determining the area median income, rather than determining it on, on a sliding scale, so to speak. The current language talks about affordability being uh, adjusted for family size, and, and that proved to be problematic, particularly as I sort of was talking about with these subsequent sales. If a family of three were to buy it, or five, I should say, were to buy it now, and subsequently go to sell it to a family of three, the difference in the housing price would really make that um, just not feasible. Um, let's see, then the other adjustment is to ensure that any uh, homeowner association fees or condo fees are included in the housing price. Um, and maybe I should step back, you know, the, the current language and proposed language as well continues to set the affordable housing rate at 80% of area median income. And it also seeks to set that no more than 30% of housing price uh, of uh, one's income goes towards housing. These are sort of industry standards, if you will, for um, at least the 30% is 80% of area median income is, is uh, one that can be amended. Um, the other uh, item this seeks to do with the ownership is to reduce the family size um, that would calculate the area median income for any smaller units. As, you, as this board knows, oftentimes you see one bedroom units come in um, and it just the housing prices, uh, actually I should say it adjusts the family income size uh, down to two people for that um, to, to sort of uh, provide for some equity in the, um, in the program. And so those are really the, the uh, most substantive changes in the ownership language. Under rental language, um, the alliance is proposing to remain with the uh, adjustable income based on family size. Um, but looking to enable families, uh, the way the language reads now, that a family can make no more than 80% of area median income uh, to remain in an affordable rental unit. Um, and the concern was if someone gets a new job or a raise um, and they maybe go up to 85% of area median income, that they don't necessarily automatically just have to leave their uh, uh, rental um, unit. And so it allows someone to earn uh, income and, and sort of save up um, provided they earn no, no more than 140% of area median income. Again, they have to sort of start out at that lower threshold to 80%, but it does allow for that uh, uh, incremental growth. Um, I think those are sort of the highlights that I was going to touch on, and 
turn it to you for public comment. Thank you, Jay. Um, with that, I will open it up to any public comment. Anyone interested in coming on up? All right, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Uh, any board comments or questions? Nick? Uh, so there's one section in here that was, was proposed to be removed, if I'm reading this correctly, which is the area here where it goes on to page two under definitions. It's, I guess I can't tell exactly how this was structured to, to its original form, but mm -hmm. upon the sale of an owner occupied affordable housing unit, the bottom of that first page and it bleeds onto the second page. Proposed buyer should provide documentation as reasonably requested by the town to support the transfer request. So this is about talking about when an, an owner of an affordable housing unit wants to go to sell. It sounds to me like the removal of this language would create, this unit would become a market unit as soon as they decide to sell without this language. Unless somewhere else in the ordinance, it's, this is what, this is what re repetitive. You know, it doesn't belong in definitions. It was somewhere else in there. But that's one thing I couldn't find. So. It was the intent of the alliance to basically say it's an affordable housing unit to start, and then this, the owners of it can sell it at market rate, and that's fine, and then we've lost uh, an affordable housing unit in the town. Is that, am I, am I correct in understanding that that's what the removal of this language would do? I don't believe that was the intent of the uh, alliance, but I can't speak to that specifically. As I said, I wasn't necessarily there for all their um, deliberations, so that's certainly something we can flag as a concern and um, yeah I mean it's not, that's I mean yeah. the, without that language in there or the removal of that mm -hmm. specific language I believe you would be taking an affordable housing unit out of the pool um, if they're allowed to just sell it to anyone without any requirement and it goes on to and this kind of dovetails with the next concern I had reading this which was under B I um, in the red area the red chunk that's taken out um, and where it says, uh, this is proposed to be removed, households shall certify to owners of rent or occupied affordable housing units that they can continue to qualify based on these standards. An annual basis should provide all documentation to support their certification upon reasonable request to the town through the town manager. Owners of rent or occupied affordable housing units shall be required to verify, certify that these units continue to be occupied by qualified households on an annual basis to the town manager. And in so, shall certify that shall be entitled to relay, rely upon the household certifications described in the preceding sentence. So it sounds to me like we're also removing the check on, on this to make sure that these are still affordable housing units. If no one's gonna report and certify that they're actually still affordable housing units, how do we know they haven't gone to market? And how do we know they're still occupied as an affordable housing unit? Unless this, again, this language didn't belong in definitions and can be found somewhere else in the section. I, these are two major concerns, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I don't like the affordable housing in Scarborough anyways, but if we're going to have it, I'm pretty sure that we should make sure that, it, one, we're keeping the units affordable, and two, that we're, we have some sort of process to make sure that they're staying affordable. That would be my take on it. I, I think yeah, the fact that we're, this, we're this section, this excerpt that we have is just definitions. It does make, make the question of whether there are I don't actual know, substantive, substantive provisions elsewhere that might address those Yeah, those at this point, I, I'm someone not here to answer that. I don't think that's so, captured in the uh, affordable housing area, so I think if that's a concern, if Mr. McGee's concern is mm -hmm. sort of the pleasure of the board, that would certainly be advisable to pass along to council for further consideration. So I'm not in favor of these changes as they currently sit without verification that there's some other language somewhere else yep. existing in the document that ensures that one, they're remaining affordable and two, that there's certification behind it. That's my two cents. Thanks. Thanks. Roger? Um, Jay, do we have any uh, idea whether the um, Affordable Housing Committee is that what it's called? The Alliance. Yeah, the yep, Alliance. Yep. If they had any discussion that Nick was referring to. Um, again, I wasn't present at all yeah. their their proceedings on this, um, so I'm really just trying to give you the best recap I can. So, um, so I, I, it's 
Okay. Best I can give you. The, uh, the, the other question I had is, um, um, are there standards that are developed by the state or by HUD or something like that, or can each community set their own criteria for affordable housing? Um, so HUD does have their standards, but the community can set their own as well. So They could probably go more lenient. I don't imagine they could go more recent. I think, you know, the definition of affordable housing that we have is our local affordable housing definition. So um, an example is our, the definition of affordable housing used to read it was 120% of area median income. Um, that was how it was originally established probably four or five years ago. Um, and within the last few years, I think, again, based on the Housing Alliance's uh, work and, and uh, recommendations to council, that was adjusted down to 80%. So, um, you know, based on the data, and I know we have others here who, who work more in the housing realm than I do, um, but, you know, HUD sort of is, can establish, you know, I've seen variable, variable reports that sort of talk about uh, affordability at 120 percent, 100 percent, and 80 percent of area median income, and 60 percent or lower. Um, and they sort of call them different, um, they have different sort of n nomenclatures, if you will, for those sure, categories. Yeah. So, um, but yes, the town can establish its own definition of affordable housing as it. And, and in a situation like this, where it's, the, the town is really just using the HUD income income levels as benchmarks. There's really, there's no, it's not as if there's any particular program. I mean, if you were an affordable housing developer, you might be held to very specific income and rent restrictions based on what, what type of financing you might be using, things like that. But this, in a situation like this, it's just the town using a widely accepted benchmark or index, if you will, for different income levels based on different household types. So um, it's, not, it's not based on any other uh, governmental right. entity kind of imposing anything, if you will. Um, well, I think, I think it's probably, I think Nick raised some interesting, at least discussion points for the, the Housing Alliance, you know, to maybe consider. So thank you. I think we might have an English PhD in the room. Uh, yes. Were, were you um, able to parse it? And, and, and I had difficulty understanding this, which tells you that um, some of the, uh, it, it got a tad complicated. Um, yeah, I have a question. Uh, so a homeowner buys, who otherwise qualifies, buys a house. They live in it, it's listed as affordable housing. They live in it for 15 years. Uh, a spouse goes back to work, their income goes up dramatically, but it's still, carried on the town books as a unit of affordable housing, possibly for somebody who no longer needs the definition of affordable housing. Um, and I think, uh, you know, when it's, when it's sold, do we, or does the town then renew uh, and say, now we need another unit of affordable housing? How, how is that handled? And I don't think it's really yeah, addressed here. It's, just that all of a sudden affordable housing units come off the list really of affordable housing units. And so I, I would be concerned about renewal and if that's otherwise in the ordinance someplace, that's, that's fine. But we don't have a renewal process here. Um, the, the shift from um, the adjusted for family size from the qualified, uh, qualifying household under the purchase to the uh, qualifying household under rental where it becomes adjusted for size. Uh, I, I think, I, I think needs to be clear, clarified. I think Jay, your explanation was helpful but that's not the explanation that's in here, the definition that's in here. Uh, and my question is on A1, so if a family of two wanted to qualify, they would have to meet the family of four standards. Is that correct? Uh, so we're now in the rental component? Yeah, I'm back to uh, A. Yep. A so no, so I think um, <coughs> as I <coughs> recollect, so no, this it would be adjusted for their family size. So I think maybe No, it's back not supposed to, to be. That was removed. Um, well, in a, for home ownership it was. For rental it was not. I think that's what I tried. 
for rental, they are maintaining the adjusted by um, family size. Correct, but I'm asking about yep. the, 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 the home ownership. Um, and the family of two would have to meet family of four standards. Uh, and there's no adjustment in terms of what the standards are. Because the standards are 80% or less the most recently published medium family income. Okay, so you're back under home ownership. Yeah, A1. Yep. A1. Yeah. Talks about for a family of four. Okay. So a family of two wants to buy. And so I think that, so a family of two, um, yeah, so if it's a family of two, essentially what this does is um, the um, HUD, or actually Main State Housing, helps establish uh, an affordable housing, uh, uh, no, not affordable housing. This is, now we're setting the income um, eligibility. They set income eligibility of AMI for a household of one through up to upwards of 10. And so essentially what this ordinance is trying to define, and that was one of the uh, variables that was um, the alliance found tricky initially, was it, it basically said, depending on how many people are in your household, that's how you determine what the income eligibility is. This sets it at a family of four, regardless if there's six people in that family or two people in that family. Um, and, and so if there's, um, if I remember right, the family of four income uh, eligibility at 80% AMI uh, for 2017, which I think was the most recently available data, was about $68,000. So if and a, a family so of basically six? any family making under $68,000 would be eligible. Um, but if you have a family of six, the, the income level is still $68,000. The way this is being the, the, co composed now, correct? Yes, correct. Yep. And, and that then creates a problem for larger families because they can't go over well, 68,000 because it's no longer adjusted for size. So I think the problem was what they were finding is for a family of six, the income eligibility actually went up even higher. If you had a family of six, if I, I don't have my worksheet for me, but it went up to $80,000, say. I don't mm -hmm. know what the exact number was. So um, it was even it was harder to obtain. Now, if their income was higher, let's say they had a family of six and their income was higher, yeah. um, under the old adjusted for family, uh, family size, mm -hmm. they could still come under the affordable housing. Uh, as, it, as the recommendation is for a family of four, and there's no adjustment for size, yeah. it simply says this is 80% for the family of four, right, that is right. the standard. So a family of six earning more than the income uh, for a family of four would no longer be eligible for assistance under affordable housing. Right. Yes. So we are potentially eliminating mm -hmm. eligibility. I object. All right, so we got right into the weeds on this. Yes, we did. <laughs> I don't know if that was really the intent. Um, although I, I, I think the feedback is all good and I think the, the upshot of it is that there are a lot of questions here, and I think it would be helpful to, to get, to have some more context and have someone from the Alliance directly, either in writing and or uh, in person with us, kind of articulate uh, in non-legalese what they're trying to accomplish and uh, maybe help explain some of the nuances of, of the, the, the language here. My general understanding based on what I've heard from the Alliance in the past and what applicants and others have, have discussed with us um, within the context of various projects has been that the, you know, they're sort of struggling to try to come up with some sort of a, of, of a system or provisions that will um, support affordable housing uh, requirements and incentives that are actually achievable and enforceable, which has been a, a challenge. So. Um, Regardless of whether one happens to agree with that policy objective, that has been their goal. I, at least that's my understanding. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it would be helpful to understand a little more about what they're trying to accomplish with some of these revisions. 
and I realize that kind of put you in a tough spot this evening, Jay, <laughs> since yep. you're sort of just the messenger on that. Um, but hopefully they'll find that feedback helpful. Yep. All right. Thanks. Um, item number six on the agenda, Matthew, Ch Matthew Chamberlain requests a subdivision amendment review for 203 Holmes Road, Assessor's Map, R23, Lot 16. Back to me. Back to you, Jamal. All right. All right, so this project is located in the RF and Aquifer Protection Overlay Zoning Districts at 203 Holmes Road. Uh, it's a subdivision amendment proposal. Uh, the board may recall approving this project back in October of 2017 uh, for an eight watt uh, conservation subdivision. Uh, the applicant actually pointed out to staff that the approved plan includes uh, three lots that do not conform to the minimum lot size requirement of 30,000 square feet, something that we all miss during the review process somehow. Um, so the applicant's proposing a corrective measure to increase the size of the of lots two, three, and four. The applicant's also proposing to eliminate the restriction on lawn size for all eight lots in the subdivision, and I'll, uh, Angela will speak on this proposal. Thanks. Um, so what they've submitted um, shows that the water quality calculations show that the proposed um, stormwater features that were on the approved plans um, satisfy the changes that they're talking about, which basically would now allow all the lots in the subdivision to clear their lots and make them from all wooded, any of the wooded areas to lawn. Um, and that the runoff from that lawn area is now treated in those ponds um, rather than the wooded areas. So they've included that. I just wanted to point that out that that should be part of the discussion. Um, and then also we talked uh, in our staff comments about, um, in Wooded and Kearns comments as well, that the changes um, didn't mean that there was some tweaking that had to happen in the HydroCAD model, so the water quantity piece. So that goes back to that the post-development flow rates should be at or below the pre. And I think that's just some um, technical, I think, back and forth that can happen pretty easily, but uh, it should be addressed, and I think that you'll see it in uh, the motion tonight. All right. Thank you. Staff have anything else on this? That's it. All right, and I'll turn it over to the applicant. Yes, thank you. My name is Paul Gabbage. I prepared, prepared the plan you have in front of you this evening. We're asking for the amendment for lots two, three, and four. Somewhere around the second or third revision, we did start off, these lots were all 30,000 square feet, and I have the paperwork that I went back through the files. Uh, at one time, we were asked to remove a drainage easement off of lot two, so pretty simple to do. I went to my office. Brought the line over, removed the drainage easement, and I don't know, the rest is history, I guess. So the lots ended up being undersized by just shipping that one line over, taking off the swale off that lot number two, um, and then it just snowballed for those three lots. Matt actually caught it and pointed it out to me, so obviously I reworked the plan. It pretty much looks very similar to the original plan, um, just so that they meet the requirements for zoning. So that's where we're at with that. <laughs> um, as far as the impervious area, it sounds like uh, the applicant feels that 0.25 acres of developed area isn't enough to actually market and or people aren't, aren't willing to purchase these properties if they don't have enough developable area. So what we ran them, re ran the model, showing that we could actually clear the entire lot and make a lawn and the pond still handle the water quality. Certainly that's not the client's intent to clear the entire parcel. Uh, we're just trying to come up with something more than the 0.25 acres that was previously approved for the project between that and what we possibly could do. Um, we're thinking 75%, so a 30,000 square foot lot might be uh, 0.5 acres instead of 0.25 acres, but not, entire, not the entire site, obviously. Um, and as far as the stormwater model, we already actually corrected those uh, two uh, corrections and still the stormwater model was working just fine. So I'll be glad to answer any questions that the board might have. Okay. Thank you. Uh, for board discussion, we do have the opportunity for any public comment. If anyone would like to speak on this, come on up, introduce yourself. I'm 
Wallace Spengler. I live on Holmes Road. I'm not sure if I heard it right, but if they were wanting to cut more trees down, I would be in favor of it because I'm. Uh, I worked on that lot with Otis Lilly, and it's wooded wetland, and you have tall pine trees in there. They have shallow roots, and I've already helped cut down a whole bunch of pine trees over on Howard Lane where people were worried about the trees falling over on their houses. So now that you've opened that up, the wind can get in there more and blow down more trees. So if they want to cut trees down, that's okay with me. All right, thank you. Anyone else? All right. Who'd like to start this time? Anything? Roger? Oh, well. I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll start off by just saying I, you know, if uh, Angela feels comfortable with, um, with the, you know, increased lawn size and everything, uh, I don't really have a problem with anything else. And okay. I don't, I don't know that she said she felt comfortable with it, not to put her back no. on the spot, but I think it, it was sort of highlighted as something we needed to... I just wanted the board to be aware of what yeah. is being proposed and what could happen, and right. I would say that it's really the calculations are black and white that they do meet the requirements for treatment so those ponds do adequately are are adequately sized to accommodate it so it, it's pretty black and white as far as a technical standpoint i did want to correct something and i think paul might have said um maybe just by accident but it doesn't change the impervious cover um so the house size and the driveways um were not changed in the modeling and in the calculations. So all it means is more tree clearing, not bigger houses and bigger driveways. And so I want to make sure that the intent is clear because now is the time if that needed to be changed to do that. So I was looking at the applicant for that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Rachel? Yeah, I'm just a little queasy about this. Um, in a lot of the other conservation subdivisions, one of the things that we've talked about is putting up um, markers, whether they're boulders or fences or uh, something, to indicate uh, that land past that point cannot be uh, clear-cut, cannot be cut down, can, it remains essentially wooded. Uh, and now we have a request to allow people to, if they wish, uh, take down all the wood. And, and I understand um, once with white pines, once there is uh, some cutting, uh, the wind does come through. It's no longer really a stand where the trees can protect each other uh, and be a bit protected against some of the, the windstorms. Uh, but... Um, I don't know at this point you know, where I would really go with this. I'm, I'm generally reluctant on conservation subdivisions to do any more cutting than is absolutely necessary. Thank you. Um, I honestly don't have any big issues with this. I mean, I think we're the type of clearing we're talking about is what you typically see with clearing a lot for residential development and I think we you know we still have protections for the for the wetlands um, and I think based on what we've seen and what we've heard from the town engineer and heard from the applicant uh, that we don't have any um, new issues on stormwater treatment or anything along those lines so um, I, I do have a draft motion here uh, with a with a condition that I would like to put forward and certainly welcome any any comments on that move to approve the project titled amended subdivision plan yellow birch estates proposed by Matthew Chamberlain as depicted on the plan set provide prepared by Paul Gadboys dated August 25th 2018 with the following findings and conditions Findings, the applicant is proposing a subdivision amendment to address the following. Increase the square footage for lots two, three, and four to conform to the minimum lot size requirement of 30,000 square feet and eliminate the restriction on lawn size of all eight lots. 
The Planning Board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation and finds that the proposed design of the subdivision amendment adequately addresses the subdivision and zoning ordinance requirements. One condition is that prior to the issuance of any future building permit, the applicant shall modify the HydroCAD model as noted in the staff review comments. This shall be reviewed and approved by the Planning Department. Second. That's the motion. We have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay. So that three to one. Thank you. Thank you. Item number seven, Michael Scammon requests an advisory opinion for a miscellaneous appeal for a conversion of a non-conforming use for 39 Inglesides Drive, Assessor's Map R50, Lot 24C. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as you guys have become aware of this process or used to this process of the miscellaneous appeal, um, it's the, the reply for a miscellaneous appeal to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a conversion of a non-conforming use. Uh, the property is located in the High Yes Parkway zone. So in, in accordance with the zoning ordinance, before making a decision on any miscellaneous appeal, the ZBA shall refer to the Planning Board for an advisory opinion. This advisory opinion is based, should be based on the nonconformance standards found in the zoning ordinance. So the existing approved nonconform use of the property is a two-family dwelling unit. Um, and the applicants proposing to convert the existing nonconforming Use to a two-family dwelling with a home occupation, which will be a commercial prep kitchen. So uh, one comment, really, in, in accordance with the zoning ordinance, the proposed use shall not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage disposal. The applicant should ensure the, that the existing sewage system on the site has the capacity to serve the proposed commercial prep kitchen, along with the existing two-family dwelling as proposed. That's what I have for this item, Mr. Chair. Sure. Thank you, mm -hmm. and I'll turn it over to the applicant. How you doing? Good evening. Uh, Mike Scammon, 39 Ingleside Drive. Um, we have an uh, a non-conforming uh, dwelling, residential dwelling in the HP zone. Uh, we've been there since uh, 2000. Uh, 2000. Um, and what we've done is we'd like to convert our existing kitchen that we presently have um, uh, that was built that was built back in 2000, and then part of an expansion that we did this spring, and uh, we meet the uh, the 20% ratio um, um, for the overall footprint of the house, and we we meet inside that guideline, and we'd like to just uh, uh, turn it into a commercial kitchen. Um, we would, we would meet all the code specifications. We, we've got somewhat a preliminary list of what those are and pretty sure we can meet those, I'm sure we can meet those requirements. Any state inspections or anything of that sort we would be required to do as well. So we're here tonight just simply to ask uh, if that would, if we could meet that appeal uh, to convert from a residential kitchen to a commercial, a, a small commercial operation kitchen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any public comment on this item before we have board discussion? No. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Rachel? Yeah, I, I have a question. It's more or less a matter of, I guess, kind of curiosity. I'm looking at the tax assessor's zoning map, and on this map, it looks as though Ingleside Drive coming in off of Two Rod Road is the only access to the property. Do you have another entrance now on Hygus Parkway? Yes, we do. Okay. That's been changed. Uh, it's now uh, on a deed it would show coming down. The paper deed would show it came down when we got the land. Uh, but now the, the 39 Ingleside Drive comes off the opening uh, on Hygus Parkway. That We share the entrance with uh, Salt Punk Climbing Gym. All right. So there's uh, adequate... Uh, ingress for um, uh, fire engines and things like that now? Yes, they visited the house a few times, yes. The ambulance. Uh, happily or just? Well, they visited. Yeah. Uh, all right. Th thank you. I have no questions. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, 
at the at the risk of being redundant, you just confirm there's no there's no retail use here. You're just producing for wholesale purposes. That's okay. correct. Okay. Yep. So no. There's no traffic that. coming in. Uh, right. Uh, other than po possibly delivery for uh, some of the stock items. Um, but yeah, very little, no traffic uh, really to speak of. Okay, thank you. Roger? Yeah, um, this is a two family house now, is that correct? That's correct. And is it, is it only one kitchen that's gonna be converted or both? It's, it's gonna, gonna, gonna be, be combined to a commercial combined. use, yes. But it'll still be a two family? It well, it's logged as a two-family. I presently live there. Uh, we were going to do an expansion in the spring uh, on one side of the house, and that expansion never took place. Uh, but the kitchen, the kitchen did happen, and we went through code on that. Uh, we were able to to put that addition on. Uh, this, the I don't know how it's logged. I guess it's logged as a two-family dwelling. It's really a single-family dwelling. Okay. And, to and correct we, that. And when you say commercial prep kitchen. Yes. Um, is that is that a product that you um, would give to like kind of small variety stores or? It well, uh, my son-in-law runs runs the business. Uh, it's it's a it's a drink beverage infusion, and it basically it's just mixing at this point. It's just mixing uh, dried fruit and spices and so forth, and uh, it, it's uh, it's an infused drink that that's mixed and uh, it has to be done in a commercial setting, commercial kitchen. That's our intent right now. Down the road, I, I don't know. Uh, we are, are interested in uh, uh, expanding out to events, an event center going on the property and we may wanna uh, do work with that as well. Uh, but right now it's just simply, uh, uh, there's no cooking involved. It's just simply mixing uh, this product, fruits, spices, um, in a bottle, sealing it, and uh, packaging it. Okay. Mm -hmm. awesome. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think it's accurate to say the board is okay with this. Um, just speaking for myself, it seems pretty straightforward. Um, for the zoning ordinance, it's not creating any new impacts or, or worsening anything. Um, and seems like a fairly straightforward amendment, and so the board will be sending a positive advisory opinion to the ZBA. So good luck. Thank you. Item number eight, JDR Trust Two requests a sketch plan review for 25 Plaza Drive, <coughs> Assessor's Map R58, Lot 32M. chance to set up. Mm. <laughs> okay. So this project is located at 25 Plaza Drive in the TPC zoning district. Uh, pulls it before the board for a sketch plan review to discuss the building materials and design for a proposed commercial building. Uh, this review tonight will primarily focus on the proposed building in accordance with the town's design standards. Um, so the applicant's proposing an infinity credit union on um, the location where a 5,000 square foot bank building was approved by the board as part of an approval for the 25 Plaza Drive project back in June 2017. So the proposed building will actually be a reduction in the previous approved bank building. Uh, in accordance with the zoning ordinance, a building in the TBC zoning district must be either a minimum of two stories or 20 feet in height over at least 50% of the building footprint. So the board should be sure to discuss this standard with the applicant. And then finally, there are several uh, elements of the building that the board should discuss with the applicant, including the building's facade, metal siding, roof design, and signage to ensure these elements meet the town's design standards. So that's what I have. Thanks, Jamel. And I'll turn over to the applicant's team. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Kylie Mason from Sebago Technics. I'm here tonight with a representative from the owner's uh, developer uh, building. Paper and gold. Um, and so again, we're just here to briefly talk about uh, the materials. I'm going to walk this. I think it works. Do I hit the button? It's on. It's on? 
Yeah. All right, so they go this way. They'll, they'll let us know if they right. can't. I'll talk louder just in case. So the site that we're talking about is actually this bank site right here. Um, it was approved with a drive through access, an ATM lane, and a, um, a color window, uh, 5,000 square feet. Um, we weren't doing much to the parking lot, and that was at the request of the planning board. At the time, we had proposed a cut through here, straight through, and it, it was desirable at that time to come through and use a shared access point uh, so we line um, the entrances. So we're not proposing any changes to site at this time. What we really wanted to talk about was the um, design of the building and specifically the metal siding. And we do have uh, quite a bit of metal siding in Scarborough already as an accent. Um, certainly the new Volvo dealership has a fair amount of it as well. So we really wanted to just understand from the board's perspective if they had any issue with the materials presented and if they thought uh, it was something to um, modify, to discuss or if it was um, a reasonable proposal for the project. Okay. Do you, did you, do you happen to have any material samples or how did, okay, great. And what we did include was photos of similar projects from Portland. Um, so this is the metal set siding. Sure. Yeah. Sorry, she's also gonna be my assistant. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and are you going to highlight on, on the elevations kind of so where these materials the are? Siding, they have gray, which is the lower portion, and then the upper right. portion is white. And it is, it's not a shiny, it's a matte finish. Mm -hmm. And it's a, um, this panel system, the Citadel panel, so it has this reveal. Okay. Um, so pretty much the entire building, the lower part, you can see the gray, right. which is uh, similar, and it has a so, straight kind of clapboard look to it, and then the white panels are larger. So Mr. Chair, I believe in the material submitted, there was a mix of, of brick and metal. Um, is yeah. that, and that would be part of the proposal, um, was to maintain that same elevation. So that view on the bottom is the back of the building, and the front of the building that you can see in the top picture is brick with the white metal panel above it. Mm -hmm. So it's the public size has the majority of the bottom material is brick, and then the back area. So we'd love to hear any feedback you might have. Um, that, and I guess um, uh, responding to Jamel's uh, preliminary comments with the, the roof, um, it's not necessarily a flat roof. It's kind of um, stacked to give the idea of height, um, but certainly using a flat roof to collect the water and to maintain a, a kind of linear finish to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. You ready for us to? I am ready, start? fire okay. at will. All right, who wants to go first? I don't have any issues with that. Right. See, Rachel? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at these designs and I don't see, um, basically most of the building is about 17 feet high instead of the 20 feet or two stories. Yeah, this is, um, this is the building from Portland. This is not the design structure for this project. We're using it as a typical. So no design has happened on the project at this point. So the only thing you're looking for is, do we like the uh, metal? It really about the general type of building. If, if the 17 feet is not amenable, then we'll take that into consideration. Um, I, 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 it's kind of difficult to decide if we like the building, if this isn't the building that you're showing us that, that it's going to be built. Right. That's why we're doing, we were trying to do a workshop so we could get some feedback. It was the request of the staff that we come to you and, okay. and have this conversation before moving forward. Um, I guess I need to see the rest of the materials. What you're saying is the uh, clapboard effect is also metal? Yes, yeah, so the gray metal, but that's the back of the building. Right. Um, the public side has brick, and then the white on the tower that has the white metal. I'm, I'm looking at uh, the front elevation, Route 1, and showing a metal flush panel with a small, uh, basically, brick panel. Right. In other words, it's not just the back of the building. So I think you're actually... So the main entrance to the, this particular building in Portland is that side entrance. So if you see on the bottom, right. um, on the right side, where it's all brick, 
that's the main entrance. And so in the Portland location, they have two entrances, one on the street side and one on the parking lot side. So they've accented those entrances with the brick, but the main one is the larger one with brick. Right. And as it is, the way the building is sited is obviously going to change because that's a 5,000 square foot building. It's reasonable to assume that we would want the narrowest facing section of the building to be facing Route 1. So, um, Ms. Henderson I, or Mr. Cherry? Yeah, I'm going to say I guess my imagination is lacking. I yeah. can't uh, visualize this. Yeah, and I think um, uh, the applicant sort of referenced it was um, we had a, a discussion. They asked, um, called staff, or I think maybe we met in the, in the hallway and sort of said, you know, we'd like to do a, we're going to come forward with a bank, but we'd like to use some more modern materials. Um, and as we know, our design standards really call for maintaining sort of the New England vernacular with sort of a, a more traditional materials, clapboards, and we said, well, this would be a good opportunity if you can at least um, start to articulate for the board the type of materials that you want to be used. So I guess the uh, reason I'm jumping in now is I sort of don't think we need to spend a lot of time worrying about the orientation of the Portland building. I think it's really about the vernacular. Um, are you generally comfortable that this is consistent or at least consistent enough with the design standards that this is something the board could see. You're not giving any approvals tonight. This is just a sketch plan. We don't have any um, any any uh, formal materials before us, but it's a vernacular in it's sort of in the right um, uh, direction or should they go back completely to the drawing board? I think it's really where um, the direction that the applicants are looking for and what staff really recommended we try to get out of a conversation this level anyway. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Jay. The, uh, again, we've seen one piece of the, the building and not the rest, so it's difficult for me to, to actually visualize how this would work. Uh, I'm, again, this isn't really the design. It's a different building, so I really have difficulty giving you advice because I don't know what I'm looking at. Fair enough. Thanks. Roger? Um, I'm familiar with the, um, the credit union over on, um, by Roth, Rothwood. Sure, the one in Westbrook. Yes. Um, I think these buildings, are, are they, that's what these are? Yes, yeah, so the Westbrook is the main headquarters. So yeah. um, that has some of the similar siding like this. Okay. Um, I mean, I think these are fine over there because it's sort of an industrial area. But I would, I would suggest you take a look at the other buildings around where this one is. And this would clearly be different in design, you know, with the, with the roof line. I mean, I can't think of a, another structure, especially a small one, in that area that doesn't have a, a, a peaked roof, you know, a pitched roof or something. So um, I, I, I would recommend you go back and take a look at how well, it's going to fit into that particular area there. Sure. I think if I were to uh, think about some of the buildings around it, um, and I'm just drawing on, I understand this is a smaller structure, but many of the roofs on Route 1 are, are fairly flat. I mean, we do have a lot of peaked roofs, but municipal buildings, the school. Um, but those are large. We and, have, and we, also right. We also have the Amato's, the gas station. Walgreens, um, even the Ace Hardware has a flat roof with an angle on it. So I, I think that we do have a fair amount of flat roofs, and I think we can bring some good articulation with the different varying heights, which I think would be a very nice mix within the Route 1 corridor. Um, well, I just feel that this one here, if it's mm -hmm. going to look anything like this, mm -hmm. Would be so would be quite different than anything else in that area, mm -hmm. and and I, I will agree with you, there are flat roofs there, but some of the buildings are pretty old or they're quite large, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's all I would recommend so, is just take a look yeah. at that and see how this is going to fit in there. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks. Sure. Thank you. But uh, just from if I might, sure. um, so the flat roof, but the materials, if they were in a good mix, do you have any issues with the metal siding? Not if they're not if they're a, a good mix, and it you know it, it you know it, it adheres to like the um, 
what we're trying to do with the northern New England type mm -hmm. vernacular, you know, sure. that type of thing. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I sometimes struggle a little bit with the whole New, New England vernacular thing, and I definitely, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't write this, the guidelines. I generally like them, and I understand what they're trying to get at. Sometimes I think it can lead us down the road of um, getting a little bit too cute with design, frankly, and I'm not a big fan of, you know, kind of businessifying things and having, you know, faux cupolas and things like that and creating things that look New Englandy just so that they look New Englandy. Sure. That said, I think we have had some pretty good examples of buildings that have been built and or renovated that have incorporated some of those elements while still having modern overall design and mm -hmm. a mix of materials. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I think I would, and I think the board generally would be open to looking at different approaches to the, to the roof and the roof line without necessarily adding lots of peaks. Maybe there are some things you can do with breaking up the, the roof lines and doing some different things with the height to create some interest. Um, that said, I mean, we, we, we would like to see it move a little more in that, in that direction of what the design standards are looking for. Um, and I think to, you know, to Roger's point, it's just, it's about not necessarily wanting everything to look alike, but having some sort of recognition of place. Sure. Um, and then it's, this isn't just, uh, you know, another branch that's just sort of coming out of a kit. And we do understand that. There, there's branding and there's a general look that you want to have, and I think that can be accomplished uh, while still meeting meeting these these guidelines. Um, and along those lines, in terms of building material, again, as you've said, there there have been examples of of things that have been done with a mix of of uh, material types. We definitely do want to stay away from reflective material, um, but you know I think a a mix of brick and certain types of metal panel um, could work. So, and again, I, I think I know the, the tenant in this case is, would be new to Scarborough, but I know the, the owner is not. And so I don't think we need to, you know, I don't think you need to start from scratch in terms of understanding Scarborough and what it is that we're kind of trying to look for. Sure. It is tough in areas like Oak Hill and Route 1 where there's a real mix and a, and a pretty wide range of, of building ages and types and over time, as new development has occurred and redevelopment has occurred, things have been moving gradually toward conform more toward conformance with the design standards. There are some things that have been there, you know, Big 20 bowling you know, is obviously, sure. you know, could not come in and get approved if it was designed that way today, but it's been there forever. So that can sometimes be a challenge, but hopefully that feedback is helpful sure. to you. And I'll just say too, you know, we do have a couple board members who sometimes take an active interest in these things who are not here this evening. Um, and I think that this feedback is sort of consistent with, with what they might say. And that going forward, um, you just be prepared to uh, keep that in mind. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I would just like to, to suggest that while um, the building certainly is going to be visible from Route 1, and you've used Route 1 as a, a comparison, uh, it also really is part of the Plaza Drive uh, area, uh, and people are going to approach it from Plaza Drive, so they're going to be looking at this building, they're going to be looking down Plaza Drive. So you might want to take a look at how it would fit within that broader development sure. there. Sure. And so obviously going, going forward with the next submission, to the extent that you can provide some different perspectives your elevations that, that are you know, full color and I know it's hard to exactly replicate or represent what the what some of the shades might be but just to give people a little something more to sink their teeth into but hopefully you've got sure. something to go on for now this is wonderful all right thank you very much you. have a great night you guys you too item number nine Patriot Realty Saco requests a sketch plan review for 1000 Hygus Parkway, Assessor's Map R52, Lot 5. No? Ready? All right, so this project is located in the Hygus Parkway 
zone. It's also a proposed contract zone at the intersection of Payne Road and Haigas Parkway. Uh, the applicants before the board for a sketch plan review for a 21,265 square foot motor vehicle sales repair and service facility. Uh, so the applicants seeking a discussion about the proposed project before submitting a final uh, or a more finalized application. As the board may recall, the applicant was last before the board for a preliminary joint review workshop for the proposed contract zone application uh, back in May, or March 2018. Uh, it was held by the town council and the planning board. So as pre previously noted by the board, the property is located in an intersection which is considered a uh, gateway to the community of Scarborough. Uh, site design and building orientation will be critical review elements uh, for this project. The applicant should discuss if any design alternatives have been considered that result in bringing the building closer to the intersection, uh, helping to create that gateway experience into town. Uh, while the contract zoning agreement will govern the design standards for the project, the applicant's encouraged to incorporate the Haigas Parkway standards, uh, such as locating parking to the rear or side of the building, requiring a 25-foot landscape buffer along the street frontage, and applying the town's design standards. Uh, to ensure the development will complement the surrounding uses. The applicant's proposing two full access drives in the project, uh, one off Haigas Parkway and one off Payne Road, as you can see on their design there. Uh, as the board, uh, I'm sure, recalls, uh, we're set as frontage on two or more streets. The site plan ordinance standards seek to have the planning board require access off the uh, road with, with lesser potential for traffic congestion and safety concerns, so the board and the applicant should, be, should discuss that tonight. Uh, the applicant should discuss specific elements of the project, such as the proposed building materials and design, and the masonry retaining wall uh, proposed adjacent to the intersection as well. And given that the board requested alternative and low impact methods to treat the stormwater on the site, the applicant should discuss the proposed uh, stormwater treatment system uh, with the board. And then finally, uh, Willowdale Brook, which is located close to the property, uh, has been listed on Maine DEP's threatened watershed list. So strong consideration of this de designation should be demonstrated uh, on the site by identifying uh, additional measures to be taken to minimize impacts to the watershed of the brook. That's what I have for you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and I'll turn over to the applicant's team. Thank you. My name is Jim Seymour from Sebago Technic, civil engineer and project manager for Patriot Realty Saco LLC. With me this evening is Adam Ahrens, owner of Patriot, Soc uh, Patriot Realty Saco LLC, and will be the owner of this proposed uh, Patriot Acura site, along with Michael Piedenault from uh, Gowran Turgeon Architects, who will discuss a little bit later uh, about the building materials and building uh, siting. Um, thank you. Uh, we're here again. Uh, we were here back in early March to discuss the contract zone at a joint meeting. Uh, since then, we've had a little bit more due diligence on the property. Uh, of particular interest is the soils, uh, which is dictating a lot of the design features that uh, we're looking at going forward. Um, in your packet, you may have seen that we had some geotechnical information citing that uh, this is sitting on some very soft soils, uh, silt clays. As a result, uh, the geotechnical investigation from SW Poll has recommended um, three options uh, for the building uh, foundation, one being steel piles, second one being a helical concrete pier, and the third being a uh, preload of the site, which would take an extensive period of time. Uh, we've looked at all these options, and we're still looking at those because the cost is substantially much more than was early anticipated, therefore kind of limiting um, a little bit of the, the, the wallet, I should say, of Mr. Uh, Aaron's. Um, also with that, we determined that the groundwater table is substantially high in the area, uh, and that's important for the sake of stormwater treatment. Uh, we'll have to bring in a fair amount of sand fill, clean fill, uh, for the parking areas to get them above the water table. Um, this is going to fall under a main DEP site location of development. Uh, it's approximately four and a half acres of new impervious uh, on this 16 and a half acre site. Uh, we have met with the DEP, had a pre-submission meeting, uh, Angela was present to that, um, and there was a lot of discussion about trying to use um, smaller stormwater measures to look at the micro watersheds of the site. Unfortunately, given the limitations of the soils, uh, we're kind of limited now with the options that we have left for treatment. At this time, we're looking at doing a couple of wet pond uh, designs 
and potentially off the very end of the parking lot, a soil infiltration filter. Um, again, this will address many of your concerns regarding to Willowdale Brook. Uh, we understand the impacts of uh, uh, these types of threatened streams. Uh, we will meet all the Chapter 500 requirements for stormwater and treatment. Um, in addition, uh, we will look at offering buffers uh, to those wetlands. There is a finger of wetland uh, that kind of me meanders through the middle of the site. As part of this uh, recent layout, we've tried to shift this a little bit to the north to mitigate that impact. Originally, we were around 15,000 square feet of the impact of that wetlands. <coughs> now we're down maybe just below 12,000 square feet. So we're looking at ways to also mitigate impacts to wetlands. We know their importance. Um, looking at this site, uh, obviously the biggest feature is, uh, as Jamal uh, alluded to, is the orientation uh, on the corner of Payne and Hygis. Uh, this is a predominant uh, view coming off the exit from the turnpike, high visibility, and during our discussions earlier in the year, it was noted that you would be looking for some kind of um, unique feature, uh, presentation as you're coming off the turnpike to give it an identity. Uh, what we have come up with, and you do not have that at this time, if you look on the drawing, you'll see a small curved wall. And what we anticipate doing there would be some kind of stone wall, which would have pillars very similar to the opposite end of the Haggis Parkway down on Route 1, uh, where we could do possibly some kind of feature, welcome to Scarborough or Scarborough, Maine, to give it some kind of identity to this west gate into Scarborough. In addition, uh, because of the elevation there, uh, the building will be brought up, and so that sign will sit lower than the building, and then the building would sit uh, about a foot, two feet higher than that wall with a plaza uh, in front of that for vehicle presentation. Um, there is, we show it as parking spaces, but the likelihood is that's going to be inventory across the front of the site. The majority of the parking, if you look at the orientation, is in the back or to the side kind of corner facing uh, Hygis Parkway. The idea is to put most of that uh, inventory and parking in the rear, again, to screen that from both Payne and uh, Hygis. Uh, our goal is to maintain some of the mature vegetation along Hygis to, to allow a nice uh, landscape. Uh, there are some fairly nice oaks and birches and maples through there. The idea would be try to isolate and, and maintain the, the better species of trees in that area. Um, and then along the front corner, that would be fully landscaped uh, with a plan that you'll be able to see during the next submission. Um, it's our understanding that you may want to have some kind of photo simulation of what that may look like as the approach coming off the main turnpike. Uh, we'll take a look and see what we can provide for that. Um, again, um, this is just to kind of get you refreshed. This was before you as a contract zone. Uh, we just want to bring you up to date because we're at that point where we're getting ready to come back for uh, preliminary submission. Uh, and equally, we will be submitting to the DEP. You have the uh, delegated review authority uh, for site location, with exception for stormwater, and that will be submitted simultaneously with the DEP. So uh, with that, I'll either turn it over to Adam or to Michael, who may talk more about the building or about the program. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Mike Pedno from Garden Turgeon Architects. I'm here um, to represent the building design and the features and elements. And I don't think this worked earlier, but try the button. Oh, sure. <coughs> no, Adam is dead. <laughs> so I'll try to speak up. Um, so the uh, top rendering you're seeing on the screen there uh, is the front of the building. Uh, that would be what your view essentially would be coming in um, towards the basically the front corner intersection that we saw in the site plan. Um, as it stands, the um, materials themselves are basically they wrap the entire building. You've got uh, silver and blue um, accent panels, and those are called what we call in the industry ACM, which is um, 
basically a, a metal panel system. Uh, it doesn't have a bright sheen. It doesn't. It's not very reflective. Um, it's a colored product, um, and so the colors that are selected um, are silver and blue. Um, that creates basically the marquee with the Acura logo on it. And then as you work around the building, sound better. <laughs> Um, and then the other materials, uh, as we work towards the sides, uh, we also have um, basically, so we've got these horizontal bands to help bring the scale of the building down. Um, it is a fairly large building. Um, and then we've got um, EFIS, uh, which is a tan color. And EFIS is basically a, a smooth textured um, finish, which allows us to meet the energy code as well as provide a finish uh, system on the building. And then as we work around the back of the building, we have um, more metal insulated metal panel with vertical, um, I don't want to call them control joints, but that's effectively what they are along the back. They're very small, uh, less than a half an inch. Uh, and then in the car wash bay, which is off to the side of the building, uh, that would be vertical exposed metal siding. But also, that's not a very bright sheen. It's not reflective. It's a it's another tan colored material uh, that we put on the back there. Um, to talk to the uh, requirements about the uh, overhead doors, uh, on this design we've, we've taken the overhead doors and basically made them a full glazed metal system. So they look very similar <coughs> to the aluminum storefront system that's used on the rest of the building. So a passerby, you wouldn't even necessarily notice that those are overhead doors. They're going to look very similar to what the storefront system is on the rest of the building. Um, I guess we'll open it for questions, or if Adam wants to add any comments. Well, if, I, if I may, just for a second, um, let you know that the goal of the design um, and the use of this lot is to be environmentally conscious to be civically conscious and also be financially conscious as it relates to uh, the cost of putting this all together. We will, together with the town, deliver a place that you can be proud of when you drive into the town, but a place that you'll notice significantly that it's not a car dealership sitting there on a the corner or a row of car dealerships. The idea is to, is to give it the proper setbacks, to give it the proper landscaping, and to, and to give it enough um, architectural features that, that <coughs> something that the, the community would be proud of um, and to do it in an environmentally friendly way. Um, just as a sidelight, I own another business that certifies car dealerships in being environmentally green and reducing the impact um, that they have in the community and we function in all 50 states. So it's not my first time as it, as it relates to trying to build something and do it the right way. Um, the lot has presented, as Jim mentioned, um, some problems, not environmental problems, but more the ability for that lot to, to support uh, major construction. So that was, a, that was pretty much the big part of the delay in coming back to you guys. So. Thank you. And we welcome your questions. Uh, Glenn Reed, who is going to be our, uh, our general manager, is also <coughs> here. And uh, unique to uh, that piece of property, Glenn uh, grew up and his parents still live four lots away from that piece of property. And, um, he can also cover the fire department part of this issue as a, as a member of Scarborough Fire Department. So. Does that wrap up your Yeah, just, just one brief point that I failed to mention, which was fairly uh, significant. Uh, with regards to the access, uh, we will be looking for access both on Pygus and Payne Road. Uh, the Payne Road exit is uh, one-way entrance right in, right out. That is the current location of existing single-family residence that's there now. The location that we've selected off of Hygis is actually the controlled entrance that was provided by MDOT um, for Hygis Parkway. So I don't know what the process would be working with DOT to relocate that. <coughs> Obviously, um, it's a delicated location based on what the building program was for the entire uh, district and uh, controlled parkway, so that is why we chose that location. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. Any board comments or questions? Sketch review? Rachel? Yeah, I, first of all, I, I would like to thank you folks for um, your, your sighting of the building and setting up a sort of a welcome to Scarborough area, and we appreciate that. And uh, um, I think it, it says a lot for Acura as uh, um, a 
hopefully a, a new part of the Scarborough community. I'm also aware that we consistently uh, struggle to deal with questions of um, franchise design, that uh, you, you have some limitations in terms of, of how you build. Uh, and I hope, I think you've started to make some very good progress in terms of being um, sensitive to our concerns, for instance, the, the garage bay doors, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, I, the question I have, one of you mentioned um, EFIS. I'm not sure I got that right. As a, what, what exactly is that? I got it was a smooth finish, but a smooth finish on what? So EFIS stands for Exterior Insulation Finish System. So it's basically a rigid insulated panel. And then on top of that is basically what's essentially stucco, but it's a thin layer of stucco. But it's not what you'd think of down south. Um, it's a smooth textured finish that it, it gets bas basically painted uh, after it's cured. So essentially, a, in terms of the way we see it and in terms of our design standards, it's stucco. With um, a well, not necessarily. Um, if you, I wish I had a sample with me. Um, it's more, um, <laughs> it's hard to describe really. Well, it is not maybe, stucco. Maybe at some point a sample <laughs> <laughs> would, be, would be helpful. Again, I, you know, I can certainly visualize what the metallic structure would, might be, or metallic finish, or uh, some of the glass finishes or structures um, that you're talking about, but that was, that was a new one, so I, I think that would be helpful okay. uh, to take a look at. Um, I sympathize with some of the problems you're going to be facing around the soil conditions, uh, and I know that's... Um, that possibly and could change some of the decisions that you have to make and that you will be bringing back to us. So please uh, keep us, uh, as, as, at least the staff, as abreast of that as possible. Uh, I do have concerns about the parking in the front. Uh, that remains in, in issue. Uh, and in our standards, we ask for it to be as screened as possible. Uh, so. I would look forward to seeing how you're going to handle uh, that sort of uh, proposal. Otherwise, we may end up looking at something, parking around the side or the back. Um, I, you answered my question about the, the entrance on Payne Road. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's not quite across from Ginn Road, is it? No, no, no. it's... it's uh, probably two or three hundred feet south of uh, Ginn Road. Is it uh, across from, not across from the Irving? Yes. It, right across from the Irving? Correct. That's, um, I'll look forward to the traffic study because that's a, a problematic area just simply in terms of turning and, and traffic. I think the right in, right out is is going to be your best option. It's the and, only option. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the... Um, and uh, what you decide to do on uh, Hygus Parkway. That's an awfully long driveway. Meanwhile, the staff did uh, have some questions about the commun about uh, the recreation areas, and we can see that later. I, I will note one thing on your you know, floor plan um, that I found, both, uh, I found both intriguing and coming from somebody who's well aware of how to service customers. And that is you have a client waiting area that's quiet, one that's for work and one for watching TV. Uh, and I think that's paying a great deal of attention uh, to your customers and customer service. And uh, that's the sort of business we're looking for here in Scarborough. Thank you. Thank you. Nick? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's a good start at least acknowledging the challenges of the site. I think between near stormwater issues, you have wetlands on there and then <coughs> bad soils. No, I suspect you guys want this really bad to continue on because it sounds very expensive. But um, I do hope that you will take proper care of the property and put all the um, put all the responsible um, stopgap measures in place to protect what's there, including that watershed. Uh, you have a lot of impervious surface, so um, you know I think as you progress, that's going to be probably one of the, the points of emphasis uh, from members of this board. Know, 
apparently this is the type of metal we like to see in Scarborough. Um, not on a bank, but on a car dealership. It's all right. Um, sorry. <laughs> 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 I try to keep it at bay, but I can't sometimes. Um, you know, it is, it is. It's a franchise. Um, I get it. Um, outside of that, you know, there is, a, and I think this goes back to uh, another one of our agenda items this evening, you know, the two entrances, taking the least busy one and making it primary. Um, and I, I still believe that there's a pretty high threshold here. I think the, uh, at least in my mind, we'll wait for the traffic study, but I think the saving grace here is that I, I do envision highest being as busy as pain one day. So how do you determine which is which? And um, I think at this point, you're right. The right in, right out is probably a great move. Um, I know the staff comments regarding moving this other proposed driveway more in line with the golf and ski. Um, I'm not, I don't know if I see that as a critical element, um, but I, I'd kind of at least wish you guys would look at it and address it as to maybe if you could get it, and if not, why? You know, that would be helpful. Um, I think that's pretty much it for, for now. I think, you know, on the design elements, I know the garage doors are supposed to be away from uh, the view. I think you've done a decent job hiding them based on your renderings here. I would like to see um, in future submissions an elevation from the intersection. So if I'm coming out of the turnpike, and I want to see not just the building, but I want to see what the landscaping. I want an elevation that shows me what it is as I pull out of you know, 95 with my car. What am I looking at on that corner? It is an important corner for Scarborough in the sense of it is, it is you know, an impression that we're, we're going to make. So um, I think that would be helpful. It would be nicer than the gas station. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I think that's it for me. All right. Thanks, Nick. Roger? You didn't leave me any questions to ask. <laughs> um, I, I, um, I really think it's going to look very nice based on what you've given us so far at that corner. Um, and I'm assuming uh, where you have the parking in the front, you're going to do, I'm assuming you're going to do nice landscaping all along there. Yes, I think the plan is, is to have that wall and between that top of that wall and those um, display areas will be some kind of low landscaping. Not enough so that they grow mature and block the building out in the future, but something low that would, you know, block a lot of cars, but it's going to, you know, change the characteristics of, the, of, the, of your visual line as you're standing there in the intersection. We'll, we'll have some, some landscaping, in, in my vision, to um, have small islands so you won't see a row of, like, the, the chairs here. You'll see three or four, and then see something that will catch your eye and separate that so you don't see the right. traditional car dealership row of cars. Okay. Um, so I don't, I don't really have a problem with the, uh, the parking in the front there as long as the la landscaping and, you know, um, is up to what our standards are. Um, I would, uh, you know, echo what Nick said about the um, access on, on uh, the parkway and just check with DOT and see whether, you know, what the pros and cons are of moving that over to opposite the existing, you know, with the golf and ski. I'm not sure how, how much of a process that is. Sometimes it's actually better to be offset just a little bit okay. rather than to be directly across. <laughs> um, again, those were controlled driveway locations established by DOT, so we'll have that conversation with them just to see you know, what their opinion yeah. is. Um, I can tell you that uh, we will not require a main traffic permit based on our initial traffic studies. Um, I think the peak uh, on a Saturday is around 80 trips. Uh, so which is below the 100 trip threshold by DOT. So, but we will be doing a traffic analysis meeting the Scarborough standards. I mean, um, I'm very, very pleased with um, everything you've shown us so far and, and, you know, your due diligence and everything pertaining to the lot. So I'm looking forward to um, seeing you back here. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. Um, so pretty well covered covered the key points here. Um, obviously, continue to work with the town engineer and others on, on the stormwater and kind of working through those issues. Um, on the, the site access, we'll look forward to seeing the traffic study. And as, as staff points out in, in, the, in the staff memo, and I'm sure you're familiar with, the, with it, the ordinance 
lays out a pretty clear threshold for when the board can consider um, alternate access, depending on trips and so forth. So, uh, you know, Nick does make a good point that it's going to be a little bit of a moving target uh, as that area gets built out, but got to start somewhere. So we'll look forward to seeing that. Um, in terms of the architecture, and I understand this is still sort of pretty schematic at this point, um, and I also acknowledge as others do that you know this is a you know, it's a franchise uh, and so forth. But um, I think I'm I would like to see um, when when you come back with more detailed elevations, which uh, uh, to what Nick said, I agree it would be helpful to see sort of perspectives showing all the landscaping and as, you know within within reason what it, what you're proposing it will actually look like. Um, I would like to see if if possible. Um, maybe a little, a slightly warmer color palette, so so it's not, you know, too stark and and bright um, um, in terms of being, you know, very silver or white. Um, and I understand that the the siding is not necessarily super reflective, but um, I would think that there should be a way to still. You're, this building's going to be pretty highly visible, and the branding will be very clear regardless, given the. The location or and the orientation and just the scale of it. Um, I just think, given given the sort of this this whole gateway idea and and what's there now, um, that you know maybe something slightly warmer would would be a would be a better fit. And again, we don't want to get into over overly prescribing colors, but um, that's just uh, that's my two cents on that. Um, one question, oh, also before I forget on the architecture, I'll just echo the comment about the overhead doors and to the extent those can truly be either avoided or sort of camouflaged um, if they're on that sort of the front visible elevation, obviously um, that's, a, that's a strong preference. One question I had, and we don't need to get into a lot of detail, but just at least conceptually, um, what do you have in mind uh, for this um, uh, 60 by 21 fenced in recreational area. That is actually a, a mini dog park uh, for customers uh, who may have pets that want to come in while their vehicle is being serviced. They'll have a contained fenced area that they can walk their dog around and okay. um, get a little exercise. Okay, that's that, that's what I pictured when I read it. It's a, it sounds like <laughs> a dog park, so there we go. Uh, obviously, as with everything else, you know, when, when, as you move from sketch to more of a full, fully developed site plan, um, we'll want to look at the fencing material and obviously avoid chain link and things like that. And I'm sure you're not going to want to dilute uh, everything else that you're already doing there. Um, so just a, just a quick note on that. Um, so with that, I think we've pretty well covered things and we do appreciate the update and hopefully our feedback has been helpful. And one quick question, and I yep. think it's more for staff and applicant. Um, there was a note in here about interconnectivity to other properties, and um, I, I know you're not proposing any new designs, and you explained why you weren't quite in a position to do so, and I understand it. Um, so my, my request for staff would be to, if you saw the opportunity for those interconnectivity with the larger scheme of things within Haggis Parkway or with, even within the Downs development, maybe where someone on staff feels like there's a potential for future interconnectivity on the property that would be useful for an easement purpose down the road. That way, when I look at it, I say, okay, these guys haven't proposed anything, nor do I expect them to know everything about the general area there. This is maybe an area where it's staff and targeted. It might be worthwhile to have an easement. Um, so just kind of a note for you guys to maybe discuss, and it would be helpful for me to kind of get a feel for what the final plan might look like, including any potential easements that might be of use down the road. Yeah, and we, we, we did look at the potential for connectivity, and I, you know, we're not, a, we're not a opposite to providing some kind of easement. I think it's just the, the natural elements are there, and there's a lot of wetlands on both sides of that property, on Crossroads, Parcel, and Scarborough Downs, and on the portion that we have available, that whole northern edge is just all large sums of wetlands. and would be very expensive or very difficult for somebody to make that connection, but I hear you loud and clear yeah, about at least leaving the physical connection. I know it's part of the ordinance, yep. and we're supposed to keep an eye out towards it, and if there was an area on this lot 
that staff was like, yeah, this is a maybe in the future down the road, this would be where it is. At least you guys had some awareness. We had some awareness, you know. If, and the answer might be, you don't have one. You know. well, there's about 225,000 square feet of this lot that is from here over that we're not developing at this time, where there'd be a tremendous amount of opportunity if it's feasible to uh, provide an interconnectivity to the adjacent properties, both behind us and to the left of us. All right, thank you. Good thought. Roger? Yeah, just one quick question regarding the, the uh, design of the building. Is this a, um, a typical uh, Acura design yes. building? Yes. In, yes. in other words, if, if I were to go to Peabody, Massachusetts, I'd see the same building? Well, I can't answer to that, but it is based on a preference item. Okay. So it's very similar. Yeah, okay. it's, okay. it's similar. It's about half the size of what you see in Peabody. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and much further back from the road. Um, we, as you can imagine, that area um, they have car dealer, car dealer, car dealer, and the building is up close to the road, and it looks like big box after big box after big box. And, and as sensitive as we are. And this is the only one in Maine. It is the first and only. First and only, and yeah. no. There's never know? been one, and there never will be another. Okay. All right. Awesome. Thanks. So, do you any any more feedback from us that you could use? This point? I think what we'll do is we'll we obviously have a little bit of homework still to do on access, and maybe with Stormwater, we meet with Angela and staff as we move forward. Uh, we're getting further along into that DEP stormwater um, evolution. <laughs> So um, we'll try to set up some meetings with staff. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Moving on to item number 10. BBS Enterprise, Inc. requests a site plan review for 62 Muzzy Road, Assessor's Map, R37, Lot 38. Uh, and Jamel's going to introduce this one to us, or sort of reintroduce it, I'll just make a comment that in some ways, even though this appears on our agenda, technically it's a site plan review, in some ways it's almost, a, kind of, I think of it as a, almost a quasi-sketch review, since we're sort of going back to the drawing board a little bit here, and we'll get into, um, we'll get into the, a little bit more of the history, but with that, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the proposed project is in the TBC zoning district, that is a uh, Fellow said at 62 Muzzy Road. Um, so the applicants in front of the board for a really what is a preliminary site plan review tonight, uh, given that some of the site details need to be finalized. Uh, so no final action. Um, the application is not ready for any final action, as Mr. Chair said already. Um, so a little bit of history, as the board may recall, uh, the applicant did receive site plan approval for the same use uh, back in September of 2015. Uh, due to a site plan violation related to tree cutting within the 25-foot stream setback, the previous town and state approvals were voided and the project was placed on hold. Uh, the applicant has since revegetated the 25-foot stream setback in accordance with the main DUP regulations and the applicant is uh, now starting the re-permitting process here tonight. So the applicant's proposing to renovate the existing farmhouse on the site into a 22 or 2,205 2,250 foot square foot office space and construct a 4,860 foot square foot restaurant and relocate the exist existing barn on the property to be used as an as accessory use to the restaurant as storage. Um, staff would like to note that given the restaurants, given the restaurant professional offices are limited to 5,000 square feet of floor area per unit of occupancy in the zoning district, the proposed division of occupancy to be permitted will need to be depicted on the building's floor plans. Um, so this will be, need to be clearly depicted on the floor plans going forward. Um, as indicated on the site and layout plan, uh, the relocated bar is proposed to be considered as an accessory structure and will only be used as storage for the restaurant. Um, I've been told, this is before me, but as the board may recall, this was a significant review element uh, back during 2015. So the applicant should ensure the board that the accessory storage space will only be used for the proposed restaurant, since storage is not allowed in this zoning district. Uh, there also appears to be limited space on the site for snow storage, so the applicant should discuss the snow storage plans with the board. And the board may want to consider enabling the applicant to provide funds equal to the proposed sidewalk 
uh, along Muzzy Road towards the town's multimodal reserve account. This approach would provide opportunities for better coordination and consideration of the sidewalk network along uh, this portion of Muzzy Road. Uh, staff suggests the applicant consider providing additional buffering, buffering provisions along the property's easterly border. Uh, currently, a wooden split rail fence is proposed. I know the space is tight, um, but buffering is encouraged. Um, and the proposal includes a structure and impervious surfaces within the 75-foot stream setback, so the board should discuss ways to limit or avoid disturbance within this 75-foot stream setback. And that's what we have. Thank you, Jamal. And I'll hand over to the applicant. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tony Pantioco. I'm with Northeast Civil Solutions. Uh, here on behalf of BBS Enterprises for the proposed Asian Fusion Restaurant. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, as I think Jamal pretty much summed it all up, um, I'm just going to recap it quick and, and get into a little bit of the stormwater and then we'll get into questions. Um, we're kind of just here to get this back in front of the board to reintroduce, reintroduce it, uh, get some feedback before, um, before we, we finalize our responses. Uh, we don't have we have to resubmit to DEP based on the on the violation of tree cutting. We've done that. Um, we don't expect to to get comments and or permits for probably a month or two from now. Um, we have resubmitted the permit by rules for um, work within the the 25 to 75 stream buffer. Those have been approved. Um, we submitted back <coughs> at the end of August. Uh, the tier one had to be resubmitted as well. Uh, that was. That was deemed null and void after the after the tree cutting. So uh, just to reiterate a little bit, uh, 4,860 square foot restaurant, um, 2,250 square feet of uh, leasable office space in the existing house that's on site. That includes the first floor and the second floor. The existing barn, um, I'm sure everyone's been by the site. The existing barn is going to be moved to the back of the site, um, incorporated into uh, the restaurant. Right now, uh, it's uh, <coughs> excuse me storage for the restaurant. They will have a walk-in freezer and refrigerator that will be accessed through the kitchen, which is basically right there. Um, so those those items can be can be taken out and give us more kitchen space. The last layout, um, I don't know if people um, board members remembered. The restaurant was kind of angled back, um, closer, closer to the stream. Since, since um, the violation, we're now showing a 25 foot setback fence that will be part of the project, um, prior to construction. With that being said, the building was rotated parallel to the parking area. Um, so the kitchen area had to get narrowed down uh, in order to keep the, the development out of that 25 foot setback. Um, storm, in terms of stormwater, the project's going to generate about eight-tenths uh, of an acre of new impervious, so as such it will not trigger a stormwater permit through DEP, though uh, we will be meeting Chapter 500 uh, standards for quality and quantity. There's an underground uh, sand filter with chamber storage in the parking lot, virtually right here. We've added a um, bioretention cell on the eastern side of the house right there to pick up runoff uh, from that area. Utilities, uh, will go overhead, overhead will come across Muzzy Road to a new pole and then run underground to the, to the uh, structure. Sewer, water, and gas have been stubbed to the site. They were stubbed to the site prior to that, to the paving of Muzzy Road in that area um, because of the moratorium that would come after paving. So essentially that's, that's kind of where we're at. Um, we did get uh, review comments, which we will address for the next mission uh, when and if we get our uh, permits from DEP. But with that, I'd just like to open it up to the board and, and get some feedback and how to proceed. All right. Thank you. Um, I will ask if there's any public comment on this item. We do have that opportunity at this stage. And seeing none, we'll turn to the board. Roger, do you have anything? Sure. Um, I, I'm having a little uh, problem with the barn, okay? It, um, the restaurant, you're going to build a new restaurant, and you're going to move a, move a barn for, st for storage for, uh, purposes for the restaurant. 
I tr I, I've been by that place many times. That barn looks like it's in terrible shape. Um, why wouldn't you just add some storage space to your proposed restaurant instead of going to all the trouble of you know relocating the barn? Right. No, the, the owner wants to retain the barn, um, and it's been basically driven by the owner. They want to keep that barn. They want to move it. They want to reuse it. Um, so it's been incorporated. The architects incorporated it into the into the project. Initially, I think they wanted to do a drive-through feature, but um, it didn't really work with traffic. So it's been incorporated as storage and um, part of the freezer and walk-in refrigerator for the restaurant. Um, okay. Um. Uh, Mr. Beale, if I might, uh, sure. one of the early conversations that staff had, and this is going back a few years, um, the applicant had, or the owner, I should say, had talked about potentially using the barn for storage of, um, they do some distribution um, to restaurants for, you know, of, um, whatever, uh, you know, takeout boxes and the like. Um, and I think that was one of the initial uh, thoughts he had for potential use of the site. And when we indicated to him that distribution wasn't one of the sort of allowed uses in the zone, he sort of understood that, and, but did, uh, as, uh, uh, as was indicated, um, does seem to have a real interest in maintaining that barn. And so that was, all those years ago, I think one of the real discussion points the board had about ensuring that the uses of that barn remain limited to really accessory storage to only those uses on this site. So, um, the, um, the barn has no historical significance, is that correct? It's not listed on yeah. our... Okay. Um, I, I, the reason I brought it up is it, it would free up some more space on the lot, you know, if you didn't relocate the barn. That's just my thought. Right. I mean, obviously, you can do whatever you want. You can spend whatever amount <laughs> of money you want to do it. So um, uh, I, I think that was primarily... Oh, on the um, on the on the sidewalk, I would I would go along with the um, I would recommend the multimodal reserve account instead of putting in a sidewalk there. That's I think that's the way we would like to go. If yeah. That's the way the board so chooses. And I think the um, <clears throat> then, then uh, the additional buffering on the uh, along the eastern property line. How do you, What's your thoughts on that? Well, we're going to look at that. I, we, we did have a discussion with our landscape architect about that. Um, easterly side being right here, we do have a small retaining wall uh, to keep our grading on our property. And we've got, a, we've got a fence on top of it, as well as we have a French drain here on the downhill side of, of the wall to pick up any runoff coming off the, the budding site. So um, it's tight there. But we can certainly look at trying to get something there other than the fence or if we can get some okay. evergreens. Um, do they have any timetable in terms of when they would like to see this all start developing? Um, not really. I mean, we've obviously restarted the, the process. Again, we've only submitted back to DEP at the end of August, so, um, you know, and I, would, I would envision at least a couple months before we get permits back, before we could even, you know, come back to the board with, a, with a response to review comments and permits in hand. Okay, I just have one last question, and it really doesn't pertain to this site, but I happen to notice that the ownership of this site also owns the Connor lot. That is correct. Have they had any discussions about doing something with that? Not at this time, no. Okay. Then maybe they could put the barn over there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all set. Thanks. Are you available to help with that, Roger? No, but I, that, was, that was a public, public yeah. service announcement. That, that <laughs> Appreciate it. Nick? Yeah, uh, so, yeah I, I do recall this one uh, pretty clearly from a couple of years ago. Um, I think you're going to end up with the same challenges that you had before, um, snow storage, tight parking areas, um, you know, protecting that watershed. Um, you know, the split rail fence, I think that's a good reminder to stay away from that area, but, you know, what do you do about runoff and, and treatment and things like that? So. Um, yeah, I'll be interested to see the next round. There's a, there's quite a few staff comments in here. I'd definitely like to see them addressed, you know, on the next round, either hammered out with staff before it comes back to us, or right. you know, um, you know, kind of a more complete. And you, you've been through the process at least once before, so um, I look forward to the more refined version of this before I, because um, it, it's it hasn't changed substantially enough in my mind to, you know, 
you, you know what you have to do. Yeah, it's very, it's very right. similar, very similar to the past so, layout. So I don't, uh, I don't think I need to spend a whole lot of time telling you to address the, the staff comments. Uh, no, we will carefully certainly, certainly do that. So, that's it for me. Thanks, Nick. Richard. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with this as, as well. I, I looked at the drawings you had, uh, A2.2, um, and actually the barn uh, seems to complement the rest of the site. So moving it back like that gives a certain flow to that the whole construction. I, I'm just intrigued by knowing how you're going to move a barn that old without you know taking <laughs> it down and putting it back up piece right. by piece. But... Um, be interested in, you know, coming out and observing if you're going to pick it up and move it back. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the, a couple of things, as I recall from, from the past, and that is that the neighbors had concern about screening uh, and uh, because of the trees being cut down and at some point there was a discussion that uh, the, the owner was going to add some additional vegetation and some additional screening for, uh, for the neighbors, and I, I don't know if that's if that's happening, but I'd be interested in seeing, you know, what's going on there. Uh, the other thing, um, parking is extremely tight, and snow storage is going to be difficult. I, I'm looking at the um, first page of the of the plan, and from this perspective, it looks as though three of your parking spaces are right in front of the dumpster. Uh, so as you're calculating the number of parking spaces that you have for the size, be careful how you're counting. Right. Yeah, our, our intention was that those would be employee spots um, because we have to provide for those. So that way, if they have a need to be moved to empty the dumpster, they can be moved. Okay. Well, it, it, that's, that's the sort of thing that should be noted on, on the plan set um, because otherwise... I'll forget, and I'll ask you this question again. <laughs> okay. uh, so, uh, and I, I echo uh, what my colleagues have said. The uh, the staff have uh, cited some the areas for you to take a, a look at, uh, and I don't have anything else beyond that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I won't belabor things too much more. Uh, again, as others have said, you know what your homework is already in terms of stormwater and runoff and get the clock ticking on the DEP permit. Um, again, tight site, parking and snow storage challenges. Um, the screening and buffering will be important just like, uh, just like it was last time. Um, and I'll, I'll throw my voice behind the, the notion of uh, funding the multimodal reserve account uh, in lieu of the sidewalk, and I am normally the sidewalk guy, but I, I do think that this is a good, this is a good case for that approach, partly because it is such a, you know, kind of a transitional area, and really not all that far from, you know, Gorm Road and the, the complete streets work that's going to be going on there, and so there may be a way to kind of integrate for the town to ultimately integrate that into what they're doing right. around the corner and leading up into the eight corners area. Um, so, as, as others have said, um, we'll look forward to seeing the next iteration of things. And um, otherwise, uh, is there anything that you were anything else you were looking for feedback on that we haven't spoken to? No, we like I said, we just wanted to get it back in front of the board and let everyone know what's well, coming. And if there was any major concerns, get them up. I do appreciate it. You know, it's obviously been a, a roller coaster ride. Um, <laughs> And I, I, I do want to say, I mean, I, I, I recall there definitely was some interest and excitement about this, about this uh, prospect, uh, about this restaurant coming in. So I do hope you're able to, you and the owner are able to figure it out and uh, move forward with it. Great. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this point, it's almost 9 o'clock, a few minutes before 9. Uh, we've still got quite a bit of agenda left. I'm going to call a recess for a very short five minute break. Just ask board members and members of the public who are here to make sure that you're back in your seats and ready to go in five minutes so we can get through uh, as much of this remaining agenda as we can. Thank you.
Thanks, everyone. Again, uh, we've got a few more items on the agenda. And just as a reminder, uh, the board cannot take up any new items after 1030. So we just ask folks to bear that in mind as we go through this. And as you're making your comments, please be mindful and uh, mindful of that and, and understand there are others who are hoping to be heard tonight. That said, we want to make sure that, that we do give everyone the opportunity to be heard, including the applicant. Um, and with that, I will introduce um, item number 11 on the agenda, Bell Atlantic Mobile of Allentown doing business as Verizon Wireless requests a site plan review for 415 Black Point Road, Assessor's Map R103, Lot 17A. I believe Mr. Chase is doing the honors on this one. Sure. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you just noted, uh, this application is coming to you uh, by Verizon Wireless, and they are seeking to establish a new um, cell tower or transmission tower, as we call it in our ordinance. Um, at the Sanitary District site on um, Black Point Road. Um, so the, the Transmission Tower Overlay District, um, there's performance standards uh, that the board's to review, and it really sets up sort of a three-step review process. The first step in the process is a priority of location. Um, once and if the board determines that the applicant has met the priority of location standards, the board then moves into reviewing the, what I'll call the performance standards or the uh, review criteria in the performance standards for transmission uh, towers, uh, which is also laid out in our performance standards section of the ordinance. Following that review process, then the board goes through the site plan um, ordinance review materials. What um, Staff would suggest the board really focus in on, at least at the outset of the meeting, and we'll see where it takes, but really try to lock in on the priority of location provisions. I think that was really one of the big questions we heard This was when this was last before the board. I think there were some other alternatives um, that the board had asked the applicant to explore, and so I'm sure they're prepared to speak to that. I know their, their materials certainly uh, uh, um, tried to address those, and so we want to be sure the board's satisfied with those. And, um, the standards really lay out very explicitly. There's sort of three uh, locations of higher priority, if you will, than establishing a new tower in the transmission overlay district. So I think it would be good when, once we get through the presentation for the board to sort of walk through those sequentially um, and, and I think sort of tick them off if possible or, or stop where you find that uh, you need further evidence or that evidence hasn't provided uh, to identify those locations. Um, and, and again, I guess what, what is also just worth noting, the reason that they, we have the priority of locations or why that was established when these performance standards were put in place and it's sort of talked about here in the ordinance is the town's vision is really trying to minimize the number of towers that need to be located in town to um, service the community. Um, so there's sort of the Again, these priority of location standards, but then there are also other standards about co-location um, of antennas and those sorts of things as we move through the process. And I guess the last thing I'll say is one of the reasons uh, staff's also really suggesting the board focus in on priority of location is that one of the performance standards um, that's required to be met um, in sort of the more um, substantive, uh, I shouldn't say substantive, but more of the uh, uh, discrete review of the actual tower itself. Um, has to do around a surety of abandonment, and we haven't received that um, form yet. And so that, that is one item that would need to be uh, submitted with a future application. So I think tonight really focusing on the priority of location um, would get uh, a, a good start in giving the, the uh, applicant and, and public an indication of at least that step. So um, I think with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Jay. And I'll just uh, really amplify that I I would like to ask uh, my fellow board members to really, as, as we listen to the, to the applicant and the, and, the, uh, and, the, and the public, to think about those uh, priority of location criteria and, and really think about whether or not you're satisfied that the applicant is, has, has demonstrated that they, that they have met those. That's really the key threshold question uh, at this point. And then, as Jay alluded to, um, if and when we, this moves forward, I think we can, we can turn our attention more to the performance standards, buffering and setbacks and things like that. 
uh, but I think it's that's a good, reasonable um, uh, piece to kind of bite off for tonight. So with that, I will uh, hand it over to the applicant's representative. Great. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And again, Scott Anderson for Verizon Wireless. And I'm here this evening also with Chip Fredette, who is responsible for doing site acquisition for Verizon, and also Keith Valente, who is our radio frequency engineer. And uh, for all these comments, I'm going to focus really on the priority of locations issue um, and our site selection process and, and leave kind of for later some of the visual and some of the, because I know you have a bunch of information, but I'll start with that, and then you can let me know um, how much of an appetite you have for more cell phone towers this evening after we go through that process. So um, just very kind of briefly um, from information that we've provided to the board, um, um, this area, this was in the original packet, which shows um, in black locations where Verizon currently has antennas. Scarborough 2 in purple is the location that we've proposed at the Sanitary District property. This shows kind of the area of what we consider inadequate coverage in this area of town. And uh, the Scarborough 2 site, uh, when you go from the attachment A to attachment B, um, shows the fill-in effect of, of adding this site at this location, again, at 100 feet. It's shown as 96 feet because that's the center line of the antennas. But this is the, the coverage area that we are seeking to um, improve the coverage down by Pratt Snack. That's the goal of this site. Um, and we are on some of these other sites in Cape Elizabeth and Scarborough and Saco and Old Orchard Beach. Um, and this is an attempt to address an area that was identified as deficient. Actually, going all the way back to 2014, when the town redid its ordinance, it had IDK communications do an assessment basically of areas uh, uh, that Ivan felt we were likely to find inadequate. And the sanitary facility um, on Black Point Road is at the top of the list of areas that the town had identified back in 2004, uh, 2014 as being uh, a delinquent in the coverage. So that's the, the goal and the target of this site. So there's two sources of information that I think are important as the board is trying to figure out whether we meet the priority of locations um, standard, um, just because this is very, very highly technical. One is the information that Keith has provided to the board on behalf of Verizon Wireless. And the second source of information is Modern uh, Grid Partners, uh, MGP. And that is a, your third-party engineering firm that has been reviewing and checking up on everything that Keith has given you throughout this proceeding and analyzing it and, and asking good questions and, and raising comments. So um, just kind of outlining the, the small pile of documents that you have in front of you on the priority of, of locations. We started back in January. Keith had given a report uh, that was part of the initial packet that has the information that we just went over on how we identified a need for a tower in this location. Modern Grid Partners then came back and asked about three alternative sites. Um, these are three areas that would fit up on the higher priority uh, tier above us before we would be authorized to, to build a new tower in the overlay district. One was the Black Point Fire Station. One was the cupola at the uh, Black Point Inn, and the third was a church steeple at 167 Black Point Road. And the, um, the fire station assessment took a little bit longer, which brought us to the, to the end of August because we had to work with the fire chief on some structural issues um, to see if that existing tower that's located there um, could work both for our height, which was something that we could do, but we also had to look at the structural. So, we went through this process, and I just want to talk briefly about these three sites that your engineer had flagged for further review. Um, uh, one, the 167 Black Point Road site is actually the church steeple that we show as Scarborough 3, so 61.5 feet. We already have antennas in that church steeple. That would have been something that we would have done uh, before we could come to you and talk about a new tower down here. That was an existing structure, so it's above us on the priority of locations. And we were able to use that structure, which provides coverage in this area. But obviously, we're on it already. So even with the antennas turned on at the church up here, we still have um, significant problematic coverage down in that area. So. We had provided information that MGP had reviewed on the church steeple, and they concluded, okay, Verizon has shown that they're already on the church steeple, so that can't actually cover the, 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 the Proud Snack area as well. Um, and they agreed with us that um, that, that uh, 
possible alternative was off the list. We then uh, assessed the Black Point in uh, Cupilla, and on March uh, 28th, Keith had submitted a report that MGP had reviewed explaining why the cupola <coughs> down um, on Prout's Neck was um, too low and too far outside of the area that we were trying to cover. And again, Modern Grid Partners reviewed Keith's work and agreed that the Black Point Inn uh, cupola was no longer uh, an option and had been properly rejected as an as a alterna alternative of higher priority. So that really left us with the, the Black Point Fire Station. And that's a stick site, and um, we concluded Keith's uh, assessment was that that, um, that tower would have to be actually completely rebuilt. Um, not only would it have to be made taller, but it would have to be reconstructed because it's not uh, sufficient structurally to hold an additional set of antennas. So because that tower would essentially need to be rebuilt, it no longer counts as an existing tower, existing structure that we would go on. It would have to be a brand new tower. And given that, it comes off the list of priority of uh, locations as well. And MGP um, reviewed that and concluded and agreed with Keith that that site was no longer um, uh, viable. So um, both from the original assessment that we had done and then through several rounds of follow-up that we did in response to board comments and comments from the public and, and very specific comments from um, MGP. Um, uh, we think that we've uh, submitted information as to why we are now down at the bottom of the list. Um, being we're in the tower overlay district proposing a new tower, and that is because there are no existing towers, um, there are no existing structures, the um, industrial and light industrial districts are too far to the north to cover this area, um, and the inn and some of these other structures um, have been properly rejected, and we think that your um, third-party engineer, Modern Grid Partners, concurs. And I just want to read the last um, comment from them on this topic, which is the September 10th memo that you have in your packet. Um, and this is, again, Modern Grid Partners. Uh, the additional narrative related to the Black Point Inn cupola, the church steeple and fire station, included in Valdana's submission dated August 31st, does satisfy the priority of locations requirement, and the town should feel confident that Verizon has appropriately addressed this. Um, so I think that's the kind of information we've given you on what we've seen. We're here to answer any questions you may have about um, the priority of locations issue. Um, and so uh, um, please let us know your thoughts and, and comments. And as Jay has noted, this is kind of a threshold issue. If you don't agree with us on this, there's, there's no point going forward. So we look forward to your questions and deliberations on the topic. Great. Thank you. Appreciate the concise overview there. Sure. Um, so we are going to open this up for a public comment now before we have board discussion. Um, I'll just uh, sort of recap the general ground rules, ask you to keep your comments to five minutes or less. Please introduce yourself and give your address for the record. Um, ask you to try to avoid repetitive comments if at all possible. We have heard from the public a couple times now. Um, we also have uh, a lot of email correspondence that's been provided to us and that the board has, so that will all be added to the record. That's all been reviewed. So uh, with that, I will welcome uh, anyone who wants to come up and introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Marvin Gates. Uh, <clears throat> my wife and I live at 423 Black Point Road. Uh, been here at all of the meetings prior to this. Uh, I think spoken at them as well, so you're familiar possibly with my point of view. Um, quite directly, I don't have the MGP uh, memo uh, dated the 10th uh, to review, but I do have a comment about what uh, Scott just said in relationship to Keith's uh, at C Squared Systems report. Maybe I got this wrong. I don't think so, though. Uh, it was uh, discussed that there were structural reasons that uh, the tower at the fire station uh, would not work. Um, I know Keith is uh, very well respected in the radio frequency engineering area, uh, certainly by Ivan and others. Um, but I don't see any structural engineering report uh, in the packet uh, at all. Uh, and there's some question, I think, that needs to be answered structurally about the viability of the tower. I'm 
pleased to accept on face value that somebody is saying something that's exactly true, but I recall when I haven't appeared in front of this board, I did appear in front of the Board of Appeals when we were uh, attempting to uh, raise the old market down at 423 Black Point Road, and at the last minute, after about three years of negotiations with uh, Brian Longstaff, very good guy, uh, uh, in order to get done what we really needed to do, uh, this is after our application was in, I'll be very brief, uh, Brian said, we really need a structural engineer to condemn the building so it can be taken down and you can build it back up due to zoning ordinances. I know structural engineers have a place. I certainly would like to see a structural engineer's report as to why the tower at the fire station isn't viable. And if it exists, I would welcome seeing it. And I don't think that the board really should act on a structural engineering standpoint based on a radio frequency engineering uh, report. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Whit Wagner. I'm a third generation homeowner at Prout Snack on 10 Birds Nest Lane. I'm also president of the Prout Snack Homeowners Association and vice president of the Prout Snack Association, whose mission is large part to protect and preserve the rural nature of that lovely peninsula. Um, in its opposition, the PNA has tried to be as professional as possible, focusing on the key issues in front of the planning board. We've retained various experts to inform our judgment so as not to just have opinions. Um, our counsel, Lee Lowry, of the firm Jensen, Baird, Gardner, and Henry, was here with me tonight. He actually, in the middle of the meeting, not as a result of the proceedings, fell ill uh, and, and had, to, uh, had to depart. But I do have a submission that he was going to present. I'd like to hand that over to Jay in a moment so copies are available to, uh, to the board. Um, in addition, Amy Siegel, who is principal with Terry Dewan and Associates, is here tonight to show a few more photo simulations of things we think are important. And you have received a letter from Ivan Pasek, I mean Pagasat, who's a certified RF engineer with the firm IDK Communications. Um, I will, uh, if I may, read a portion of what Lee Lowry was going to present, and I will turn these copies over to Jay. Uh, this evening, if he was here, Lee Lowry representing the PNA. Uh, from the firm Jensen, Baird, Gardner, and Henry was going to present some issues on visual impact analysis and buffering and also priority of location. And as the chairman has suggested that priority of location is the more important issue, I'll just read uh, three short paragraphs from his letter. C-squares lettered is noteworthy, noteworthy for saying nothing other than a higher tower would be required at the fire station to accommodate Verizon. It says it might have to be 120 feet high, but it states no conclusion, positive or negative, about whether that can occur. This analysis falls far short of substantial and justification for rejecting the fire station as a potential location as required under the priority of location provisions. Furthermore, the priority of location analysis requires RF coverage maps and analysis. The section requires all available optional antenna heights or possible heights. The applicant has provided no submittal of RF coverage maps as justification, and this, this application should be rejected for that reason. We believe the board's expressed concerns deserve a higher level of response than the materials put forth by the applicant on these issues. Further, it is clear that the applicant has failed to carry its burden to prove by substantial evidence and justification on the standards for gaining approval. We ask that this application as presented be rejected by the board. Yours very truly, Lee Lowry. Uh, you have that complete letter. I just read a portion of that. The PNA is joined in its opposition of this tower at the suggested location by the friends of the Scarborough Marsh, the Scarborough Land Trust, Maine Audubon, and many residents of Pine Point, Piper Shores, and Higgins Beach. 
the Scarborough Marshes, the Nunsuch and Libby Rivers, the Rachel Carson Wildlife Preserve. These are all environmentally centerpieces for the town to be protected and preserved in their natural state. We're asking the planning board to insist that Verizon fully explore the possibility of erecting its cell tower at the fire station at the intersection of Route 77 and 207. The existing pole can be reconfigured to support Verizon. The fire station is at an elevation of 38 feet versus 14 feet at the sanitary district. The 80-foot pole at the fire station is the equivalent of a 104-foot pole at the sanitary district, and Verizon has stated it needs only 100 feet. The fire station enhances coverage at Piper Shores and Higgins Beach while still serving Scarborough Beach and Prouts Neck. I urge the planning board to require Verizon to present all the necessary facts as to whether the fire station location is viable or not. It is our opinion that to date they have not done so. Finally, our goal is, is not just to oppose the tower at the sanitary district, but to work with Verizon and the planning board to find a constructive solution which maintains the beauty of the marshes while providing enhanced coverage to the community it's our opinion the fire station location meets these objectives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and before our next speaker, I, I just want to say, and I meant to say this earlier, that um, you know, we're all making note of the, of the comments from the public, and I'm sure the applicant is as well, and that um, as, as appropriate and as necessary, we'll, we can get into some of these questions that are, that are being raised. But we, we can't have any you know, back and forth between the speakers and the, and the applicants. Understood. So I just wanted to put that out there for anyone who's yet to come. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Amy Siegel, as Whit mentioned, from Terrence Dewan Associates. And I've got a couple additional graphics uh, that we've prepared uh, since the last time I was here before you and submitted a collection of images. I think this is on, yep. So uh, this image, which I'll give a copy to Jay, is a viewshed analysis that we prepared for a 100-foot tower at the sanitary district site. The areas in pink are sort of the areas of the potential visibility of that tower within a two-mile radius. You can see that, you know, here, uh, all this pink area in here is the marsh, so you know it's a it will be a highly visible item, highly visible structure uh, from within the marsh, and um, you know when it gets to priority of location, we certainly would hope that the board would um, think about the sort of extensive visual impact to the marsh itself. I've got a couple images just to refresh on. Uh, This is the image that we showed last time with that 100-foot cell tower. I understand that we have four arrays on there versus two, but the tallest two would stay. Um, just to remind people, I know we're not talking about buffering, but um, just to kind of give a sense of that. Uh, the applicant also talked about the uh, visibility of the sanitary district buildings there. Certainly, um, one thing to consider would be some additional buffer mitigation uh, to minimize that as well as the tower. Uh, similar structures. This is the stealth tower, 120 foot stealth, stealth tower that we showed last time, which simplifies uh, the, what's visual in the structure. <coughs> this was the image that we showed with an alternate location um, offset from uh, still on sanitary district property, but offset that would allow for more of the existing uh, evergreen vegetation to provide a buffer from the marsh. And some additional graphics that we've produced. Uh, this is the view from Pine Point, sort of down at the end of the eastern end of the beach. And this is a 120-foot stealth tower that we showed on, at the sanitary district, just to kind of give a sense of that. And here's Ferry Beach here. And we just looked at the Black Point Inn, I'm sorry, the Black Point um, Fire Station as a potential um, you know, just to see what it would look like from Pine Point, and it's basically invisible, it's sort of hidden in the trees here uh, to the left. So um, it's you know basically would be imperceptible from there. Um, so just sort of offering some additional graphics for the board to consider uh, when we're talking about priority of location.
Thank you. Uh, my name is Linda Woodard, and I'm the director of the Scarborough Marsh Audubon Center. And we'd like to provide some input on the proposed communication tower. The proposed location of the new Verizon communication tower near Scarborough Marsh has implications for wildlife, likely including significant levels of bird mortality. A variety of federal best practices around communication tower design, siting, and operation could help mitigate the project's ne negative impact on wildlife. The proposed location of the communication tower is in the middle of a complex of rich and valuable wildlife habitat. Scarborough Marsh is the state's largest salt marsh complex of significant value to resident and migratory birds, which has led to an important bird area designation. Studies have shown communication towers are a cause of mortality, particularly for passerines or songbirds who migrate at night. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has recommended best practices for design, siting, and operation of communication towers. Some of these include placement, select areas already degraded for tower placement. Towers should not be sited near wetlands. Other known bird concentration areas, such as important bird areas, or in known migratory bird movements, routes, or daily movement flyways which is present at Scarborough Marsh. Co-location, use existing towers or other structures where possible to reduce the number of towers across the landscape. Maine Audubon strongly suggests that Verizon do an exhaustive examination of the location at the fire station, which is less than one mile up the road. These best practices have been brought before the committee before and to Verizon, but we haven't seen any evidence that they have been reviewed. So we recommend that they review the best practices guidance from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and incorporate their recommendations, particularly around co-locating, design, placement, and lighting. Because of the trying to be brief, I didn't go into all of the recommendations, but they are listed, and I did provide a um, link to that to all of you if you're interested in seeing all of those. Regardless of location, monitoring bird mortality at a newly installed or construction tower for at least two years post-construction is recommended. Given the proximity of their proposal to several important bird habitats, monitoring will be important to understand the true impact of the tower. To go in another direction, I just want to let people know a little bit about the visitation and the economic impact of Scarborough Marsh. Just the Scarborough Marsh Audubon Center has over 10,000 visitors a year. We have a lot of Scarborough students. All of the third graders come to the Scarborough Marsh. We have middle school and high school students from Scarborough and many surrounding community, thousands of school children. We have many local residents that come. They come as visitors, they come as volunteers. We have over 500 hours of volunteer time, most of those people being Scarborough residents. We have visitors from around the world. We are listed in the 50, place, 50 best places to bird before you die. The, um, birding is very popular. It's the number, one, number two activity beyond gardening. And these people also go to other places around Scarborough. They walk the Eastern Trail, they go biking, they rent bikes, they rent paddle boards, things like that. They also eat at restaurants, they stay in motels, they go visit stores. So there is a local economy boost because of this. And just to let you know, Maine Audubon, any of the money that we raise as a nonprofit goes right back into Scarborough Marsh into programming and in monitoring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Stephanie Smith. I live on Audubon Way in Scarborough, and I am president of the board of the Friends of Scarborough Marsh. Um, and we remain strongly opposed to the current location that Verizon is projecting for this cell tower. 
Um, and I'm not going to get into a lot of a lot of things that other people have said, but but to our to our belief, the natural beauty of the marsh is critical to both locals and visitors alike. And citing the tower where Verizon is projecting will will in fact destroy that that natural beauty, and it will destroy the viewscape. It's viewable from all over the marsh, not just immediate in the immediate vicinity, but from several different viewpoints at, at various points. Um, we would encourage Verizon to re-examine the possible sighting of the tower at the fire station. If, if it needs to be, to be constructed there as a different tower than the one that currently exists, it seems to me that Verizon is projecting to build a tower somewhere. If they're going to build it, might as well build it at the fire station, which is a much more desirable location. It's not great but it's certainly better than the location on Black Point Road. Um, other things that might be considered if Verizon would be willing to, stealth towers, even distributed antenna systems, DAS as an acronym, um, they should be encouraged to look at those seriously as a possible, um, as a, some kind of possible compromise to, to get what they need and also keep the people of Scarborough and the people who value the marsh comfortable with what they're trying to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lucy LaCase and I live at 52 Old Neck Road. I've spoken before on this proposed cell tower issue, but really feel that certain points cannot be said enough. The Scarborough Marsh is simply too important for our town to let it be blemished by an unnecessary industrial edifice, and I hope that you, our town planners, agree. My husband and I have lived in Scarborough for nearly four decades, and before that, I had spent every summer here, as had my mother before me. Our kids went to school in Scarborough, and I've served on various town committees over the years. In other words, we have solid roots here. We care deeply for this town and its amazing resources, and I know that you do as well. Thank you. Scarborough has so much going for it. It is a coveted place to live and to visit because of its proximity to Portland and the jet port, its pristine beaches and dramatic rocky shores, its rolling farmlands, and its magnificent marsh. However, other towns are close to Portland, and other towns have beautiful beaches, granite shores, and rural farmlands. But no other town in Maine has the Scarborough Marsh. As you know, the Scarborough Marsh is the largest estuarine system in the state, and it is integral to our town's history, its economy, its identity, and its brand. And from a wildlife perspective, it is an essential resource, providing food and shelter for countless species. The Scarborough Marsh is the jewel in our town's crown. And we as residents, and you as our town leaders, should be doing everything we can to protect and preserve this highly valued resource for now and for future generations. If this language sounds familiar, it should. Scarborough's new comprehensive plan is to be guided by core fundamental principles, including operating in a manner that conserves and safeguards natural resources, becoming a model of environmental stewardship and managing the town's resources wisely to support present and future generations. Verizon's cellular transmission tower, as proposed, would desecrate the marsh landscape our prized natural resource, now and for future generations. Towering above the trees, it would be highly visible from many locations, for now and for future generations. Verizon has justified the eyesore by suggesting that they would just be adding to an already compromised view shed because of the sanitary district's building. That is no argument. First of all, two wrongs don't make a right. Secondly, the sanitary district structure is barely visible for much of the year when it is buffered by deciduous foliage. As an aside, that department should be encouraged to plant evergreens as a more effective year-round buffer, but that is not the point of tonight's discussion. Because of its height, Verizon's proposed tower would always be inadequately buffered and would always be visible year-round for now and for future generations. For that reason alone, it should not be permitted at that location. Additionally, the zoning ordinance strongly favors the co-location of cell towers rather than erect 
new towers at new sites. And this is what we're supposed to be focusing on tonight. Verizon has not adequately considered co-locating at, at the Black Point Road Fire Station, where a transmission tower already exists. At that site, other communities besides Prouts Neck would benefit from enhanced cellular coverage, including Piper Shores and Higgins Beach. I understand that you, as our town planners, need to follow the zoning ordinance. That's your job, and I would expect no less. And given that necessary adherence to the ordinance, Verizon should absolutely be denied their request to erect a transmission tower at 415 Black Point Road on the grounds of inadequate buffering and for ignoring the opportunity to co-locate at an existing site less than one mile up the road. Verizon should be encouraged to resubmit an application for co-location at the fire station from which the splendor of the marsh would be preserved and from which many more Scarborough residents would be served with enhanced coverage. That feels like a no-brainer. We are counting on you, our planning board, to do the right thing. We are counting on you to reject Verizon's application as it now stands. We are counting on you to protect the jewel in our crown, the Scarborough Marsh. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Roger Chabot. I live at 12 Houghton Street at Higgins Beach. And I'm also president of the Higgins Beach Association. And I'm here to support the building of the new tower if it's built at the firehouse. Mainly because of uh, many, many people coming to us, myself, asking why we can't have better coverage at Higgins Beach. And by building this tower, this certainly would help us and, uh, and, and communicate better instead of having seen people go outside of their houses to, to uh, answer the phone because of no coverage at Higgins. Uh, this, I think, would help us, and I support uh, the tower at the firehouse. Thank you. Just for the record, uh, could you please spell your last name so we make sure we have it correct? Yes, yes. C-H-A-B-O-T. All right, thank you. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure. Good evening, my name is C.D. Armstrong, One High Point Road, Scarborough. I'd like to thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and the board and the staff for being patient and listening to us all. Uh, I, I would add my voice to those opposed to the, to the uh, siting at the sewer district, and although I, I really don't like the tower at either location, any higher than the existing towers, uh, the lesser of two evils would clearly be at the fire station. So unless there's a very, very clear engineering report which says that it cannot be co-located there. It would make perfect sense to me that the board would simply require that as the next step. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Going once, <laughs> twice, all right. Um, again, thank you very much for all the comments. Um, I appreciate you uh, being concise and, and providing the thoughtful feedback. And again, we also have uh, everything that's provided, been provided in writing going all the way back to when this process first started. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to turn, we'll, we'll turn to board discussion. I'm sure there'll be some back and forth with the applicant. We'll give the applicant the opportunity to, to respond to, to some of these questions. Um, and I can do that now, or I can do it as you go. Um, there were four things that I thought would be helpful, but I can do it. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and, okay. and take a stab, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Okay, great. So just Thank four you. points. One, in the submission that we provided on the 31st, Keith was clear that we need 120 feet at the Black Point Fire Station. Um, I, I do actually have a structural report um, that shows that the tower and the foundation would have to be completely restructured, but based on guidance from staff, and Jay can correct me if I'm wrong, um, we need to go uh, an additional 40 feet up on the existing tower. So once we need to do that, then we're not using an existing tower or structure, um, and then that one drops out of the priority of locations, but we can certainly provide the structural letter that shows that the entire thing would have to be rebuilt. Um, 
Um, so we, we, we do need 120 feet there, and, and I think we were clear in the August 31st submission. I appreciate Lee Lowry as an attorney has an opinion on it, and now I'm going to say something a little bad about attorneys, and that's we're, we're not very good RF engineers. So um, the Proud Snack Association has hired Ivan uh, Pazicek, um, who was the town's uh, RF engineer, and what is missing from the comments today is a report by Ivan that, that disputes anything that Keith had said or disputes that we need 120 feet, and Monogrid partners agreed that uh, with Keith's assessment that we needed 120 feet, and therefore that was not uh, an option for us. So, um, and also I think it's worth noting from Ivan's report to the town, he actually went and looked at all of the existing sites, and he looked at six, and um, what he concluded back in 2014, of these six locations, there are three that are not feasible for providing additional space for carriers. The three are the Highland Avenue Fire Station, the Black Point Fire Road Fire Station, and Springbrook Park. These three wireless facilities at these locations are 90-foot monopoles with antennas located inside. The next available space for mounting antennas would be below 80 feet, which would not provide for substantial coverage. And actually, Ivan had it wrong that the Black Point Fire Station is at 80 feet, so we would be even lower than the elevation that he concluded back in 2014. So certainly if Ivan, on behalf of Prout Snack, had given you a report saying that Balderdash, 120 feet is nonsense, then uh, I would be nervous and I would, we would ask for another round. But I think um, the information that you've been given, which is consistent with what Ivan has said previously and, and what Modern Grid Partners has said, shows that the fire station just simply doesn't work. And, and so uh, I think, and, and Jay again can clarify, but I think at this step when you're doing priority allocations, I mean, as you might expect, we don't agree with the visual impacts. We provided you bird information which showed that there were no substantial impacts, but, but I think those are for later. So I don't think those are relevant to the priority location. You folks are just trying to figure out really whether or not um, the Black Point Fire Station or the cupola at the Black Point Inn um, are, are alternatives. We think we've shown um, that they're not, and we think your engineering firm agrees with that. And um, we haven't heard anything additional tonight that causes us to question any of our conclusions. So those are just the, the four responses, and then we're here to answer any other questions as you folks talk about the issue. Thank you. Uh, Nick, do you have anything? Thanks, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> This is awesome. Okay. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it first, right? right. So Absolutely. here we go. Um, yeah. Uh, I love all the legalese. This is awesome. It really is. Um, it's <laughs> both sides. They've got a point to make. Um, I can pick through this thing best I possibly can. Um, and what I'm going to say here is um, I'll, I'm going to phrase it as a question. Is there any reason Verizon wouldn't want to use the Black Point Fire Station if it could meet coverage needs at 120 feet. Are you telling me it's a cost thing because you don't want to tear something down and use it? Are you telling me it's a coverage thing because you still can't achieve the same coverage you're looking for as opposed to the other location? I know what this ordinance says and I think the lawyers have done an excellent job pointing out exactly why they believe this is n that is not a suitable location based on the language as it's presented here. The question is, does Verizon not view that as a viable site because of cost, because of coverage, or are you just following the ordinance and saying we're gonna get things, this thing through the bar? I, I, wanna, I really want an answer here. I mean, I think it's fair to know. I mean, if, if the alternative was for everyone in this room could hear you know what, we can tear that thing down on the Black Point Fire Station, we can put up 120 feet, we can get our coverage out of this, but your ordinance says we can't consider it as a, uh, as a location of top priority. But everyone here in this room said, you know what, we can walk out shaking our heads saying, you know what, this was a good compromise, I think we, I think we nailed this. What's the applicant say to that? Well, I, I think it's a very good question, and I appreciate the kind of desire to kind of find a, 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 a solution that might work for, for everyone. I, I think that, um, and, and I'm not sure how this comes up um, in kind of the second round that Jay flagged of, you know, you make a priority of locations determination based on the lawyers and the language, but then you get to the issue of impacts. It's kind of like, you know, McDonald's comes in and says, we want to put a McDonald's right here. 
and then somebody comes in and says, you know what, I don't want it located here. I'd rather the McDonald's goes up there, and we think that the McDonald's would be just as nice up there. The reality is usually is that everybody around where the McDonald's would be moved to shows up and comes out and says, wait, wait a second, why, why is it here? Why don't you put the McDonald's down by the sewer district property? That's where the town identified. So how that would go, that would be a different permitting proceeding. We'd have to come in, we'd have to get the leasing rights, we'd have to figure out what to do with AT&T's antennas. I'm, I'm not gonna tell you it's a cost issue because nobody's gonna believe it and, uh, and that's not it. I mean, Verizon has money to do you know, whatever it needs to get their antennas up. But I think as part of your ordinance, the first step is figuring out whether or not the, the Black Point Fire Station is an existing tower that we could go on to minimize the need to build new things. And I think there is a, a agreement by the engineers that you've got an 80-foot pole there that people are comfortable with. When you move that pole to 120 feet, 40 feet higher, you're, you're you know, 50% increase in the height, it's gonna have significant visual impacts. It's gonna have significant avian impacts. If you look at where the Black Point Fire Station Tower is, the birds don't distinguish between a, a, a tower there and a tower at the sewer district site. They're right on the fringe of the marsh, and we're proposing a 100-foot site, and um, the, the Black Point Fire Station would be 120. So it's gonna be taller, it's gonna have greater visual impacts. The other problem, and I'm, I'm trying to answer this practically, just so you know how we go through. When you have a stick like that, where the panels are mounted internally, every time a new carrier comes in and wants to co-locate, they need 20 feet of new pole, because in order to mount the antennas inside, they have to be stacked with uh, one section at one level and one section at the other level, which is why we need to go to 120. So, for example, we've given you information that I know is not technically part of our application, but an indication by Sprint that they can co-locate under us um, at 86 feet of the tower that we're proposing in the sanitary district. If we were to go to Black Point and build that at 120, in order for Sprint to use that, they would have to go to 140 feet on that pole to get the two rad center heights that they would need to co-locate that. So you've got, even though kind of could we do that isn't really before you, and even though Sprint isn't really before you, Trying to answer your question is, okay, as a planning board, how do we strategically provide for the build out of networks in ways that minimize impacts? There's a very good chance that the, the stick at the fire station would have to be 140 feet and be completely rebuilt, um, which would be significantly greater in avian impacts, visual impacts, and the light, um, and, and, and the like. The other thing that you probably have figured out about that is that tower is not within the tower overlay district, so it doesn't even come before the planning board. It would be a municipal use, and you do some sort of advisory ruling on it. And so, you know, the public around there that would show up and say, wait a second, uh, what about Sprint? This is gonna be 140 feet, I don't like that. They would be told, well, you can come and, and give your comments, but um, this isn't actually something that's coming before the planning board. So we appreciate, and I don't wanna say this right, we appreciate that when Whenever you go into an area where you're proposing to do something new, that often people are frustrated and they don't want that, and they want to identify other areas that might be better as kind of a win-win solution. But even setting aside the ordinance, which I, I don't think we, we get there, um, um, but even, even if we just talk about it as a practical matter, the development at that site is bad for co-location. It's gonna be much higher. Uh, it's got fall zone issues. It's not subject to planning board permitting. There are a number of, of aspects of the Black Point Fire Station that really make it a much poorer site. If the town is, excuse me, is trying to kind of look ahead and figure out how to accommodate better coverage in a way that minimizes impacts. The site that we're proposing is in the exact area that the town's engineer identified as having a coverage problem and the sanitary district site was identified as a, a good site for this. And Ivan's got a box in the back that we submitted with our initial application that's got a box right where we're proposing to put it because this is a good site. And as the commenter, the, the woman from Audubon said, one of the guidelines is you put this next to existing things and the wastewater treatment uh, plant is there. So there, and at 100 feet, it's better than 140 feet uh, for avian impacts. So for a bunch of reasons, we think that everything, visual impacts and everything associated with the sanitary district site 
were identified by the town as a good place, um, and actually for these practical reasons is a far better site to try to get a couple of antennas up with much lower impacts. I, I hope that's helpful. But if it's not, you can stop me around and say, no, I'm not buying that, or I've got to follow it. What, you know, I, I, we're, we're trying to give you kind of the big picture and setting aside the fancy lawyer language. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so you know, I'm hoping Corey will say this at some point too, but so we, when we as a board um, get asked to serve and get appointed by the council, we, we go in to see Tony, and she reads us a blood oath and we swear to uphold the ordinances of the town of Scarborough. And I feel um, really, really torn on, on this because I think we are becoming a victim of some poor language um, in our ordinance that probably could have been rectified with the, with the addition of a word towers instead of just telecommunication facilities. If it said telecommunication facilities and towers on one C, I think we, we we would have more leverage in a situation like this. Um, we have a peer review memo that states that Verizon has submitted all of the, this is the third party peer review memo, that um, Verizon has submitted all of their information. Um, whether or not we as a board will accept it, you're right, that is within our purview. Um, I don't, know how, I don't know how to say this. It's, it's such a disappointing feeling to, to be asked to uphold our ordinances and then to see what could be probably a very reasonable fix within the language in our ordinance and with a willing applicant, given you had your reasons, um, to try to compromise on something like this. So that's, I'm going to leave it at that. I, I'm a little pissed. Thanks. Understood, and I appreciate you hitting lead off, but to, and, and to just keep that on you for a second, I'm, I'm inferring from what you said that following the letter of the ordinance, you believe that the applicant has I think the with, with priority the, of locations the criteria? Review, yes, and with all the submissions and using the language we have, the Black Point Church, in my reading of the language here, falls off the list because tearing it down to put up a new structure is not what that priority of locations list is an option. If it actually said a new transmission tower slash, I'm sorry, tell, uh, a facility slash tower, if the language said slash tower, I feel that 1C would allow this planning board to say we could prioritize tearing down that one and making you build on an existing site, a tower site. It says we can ask them to do it on existing facilities doesn't say existing towers. And I think that's a huge miss on our part. That's just my, that's my reading of this. Um, right. And that's um, one of four tonight. So. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Roger. Um, I tend to agree with, with Nick on, on this. Um, based on all the material we've received, it appears that Verizon, uh, the applicant, is meeting the requirements as stated in the ordinance, but it's um, it's this is really I, I don't see where there's a demand for this. Uh, you, you say there's a demand. Verizon says there's a demand. We're not, we're not hearing there's a demand. Um, well, I think that the the town, uh, if I could just interject a minute, the, the town, based on the fact that there's an overlay district, uh, had identified that there were that there were coverage gaps. Well, we're not hearing from so. the residents in that over, overlay district. We have heard from residents in that overlay district, actually, um, who have who have, take, who have have taken issue with that. But yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, and we can we can let the applicant respond as to sort of how they how they define demand. And and I I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just I wanted as just a point of sure point of record, um, just make clear that it's not. It's not just the applicant coming to us with a claim that there is un, unmet demand. That there, you know, that that's part of the underpinnings of, of the overlay district. If just for clarification, if this were to go in at the sanitary district, 
Did, it's my understanding uh, Higgins Beach would not be within the coverage area. Is that correct? That's correct. When you, sh you see the area that um, lacks coverage, it's down in this area, uh, down by uh, uh, the bottom of Black Point Road. And so the coverage is in the area where the, the tower is located. Um, I think this is Higgins Beach over here. So there would be some benefit, but at least what we show on our uh, charts and plots that we think is adequate coverage, um, that area doesn't cover Higgins Beach. Um, you know, and what you're trying to do here is, you know, as you go through a priority of locations assessment here in town, the first place we have to go is the church because it is a structure that we can use and you wouldn't be able to give us a, a permit for a larger tower that would cover anything else until we go into the church first. So you go into the church and then because of how the ordinance is structured, that becomes part of the existing coverage and then you move from there. And the tower is designed to be tall enough to fill the gap, but not so tall that it overlaps with the others because that's a problem. And also, you know, we, we could go up to 130 feet here, but it's just not necessary. So 100 feet is the, is, is the, uh, the level that's necessary to, to make that coverage. Trying to cover those other areas would require addition facilities. And you'd have to go through the exact same analysis looking at existing structures or existing towers you know, before you would be able to build a new tower. Well, see, that's where I agree with Nick on that, and there's, there's a problem with our language and our ordinance, and this is not your fault. Um, so uh, I'm a little lost when you're talking about the Sprint Tower, though, because um, as I understand it, Sprint said that they could go on to your tower, the proposed tower, at 86 feet. Mm -hmm. How much coverage does 80... How much coverage would they, I mean? Can, well, it would, I mean, we don't know because yeah. the carriers don't share that information. I mean, so, if you have to be at 100, right? That's yes. what you're proposing. I can't, but then you said if, at the, at the fi if, if you were to go on the fire station, they would have to be above you? Is that what you said? Yes, because, because the, the, at 80 feet where, where that is, we would take the, the, the next couple of sections above it, and we need to be at 120. So one of the things that is a challenge while we're doing this is we have no idea what any of the other carriers' needs are because if they came to you for a site, all of their black locations would potentially be different because they might be on different existing sites. So um, we try to kind of, we reached out to Sprint just because Sprint had been contacting the town and saying, we have issues in this area, we might want a site as well. And because this had come up at one of the prior meetings, we contacted them and said, hey, would you be able to use this site, and they just responded and said, yes, we could go on the one level beneath you, 10 feet beneath you. But we don't have access to their propagation maps or any of that. That's all confidential business stuff that tells them how they're building our network. And so um, all we know is that they could, they could come underneath and they wouldn't have to make this tower any taller, which is not really in front of you because Spring hasn't filed an application and who knows, but it had come up, so we just wanted to try to get some information from the board on that topic. Um, we, you know, if we did a 200-foot tower here and reconfigured this, you know, you might be able to cover Higgins Beach, but nobody wants a 200-foot tower here. So at 100 feet, it's actually closer to the tree line, is not visible from most areas. So in kind of doing this, there's kind of a balance. And I think when Ivan was working with the town back in 2014, he did an assessment of where all the existing sites were to identify places where you could do co-location and, and improve coverage. And, the Black Point Fire Station was rejected because it was too short, which is the same thing we've concluded here. And one site won't do the whole town, but we're trying to get the balance right of, you know, this is a significant improvement in coverage in this part of town. An area that was identified in 2014 as having deficient coverage, and this is going to be a significant benefit here. And kind of answering the question I wasn't asked, um, people that are frustrated with cell phone coverage don't normally come out to planning board meetings when there's a tower application. They, if they even know what's going on, they go, oh, thank goodness, somebody's actually going to do something about the coverage. So we appreciate that people affected by this come out, and they're motivated to come out. A lot of people that support it, just they won't come to meetings like this because they're doing something different. And we think we've tried to go where the town indicated, go below the height by 30 feet that we were allowed to, to try to 
solve this problem that the town had identified in 2014 and do it in a responsible way with the fewest impacts. So that, that's been our goal. Um, the, um, th this is really difficult because uh, I, I know, I live in a Pleasant Hill area and the cell phone coverage, even with Verizon, is terrible in that area there. And I would argue there's many more people living there who are probably Verizon customers than living down at Prout's Neck. Um, so, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not running for anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, what we try to do, full papers. you know, so we comply with the terms of our license sure. is to provide coverage where it's inadequate. And we appreciate there may be other areas in town, but this is an area of significant traffic of seasonal and full-time residents. And it was an area that was identified specifically by the town as having deficient coverage. And Ivan had, had some information from us. He had some information from T-Mobile, some information from AT&T. So the carriers actually gave the town some of their propagation information so that the town could go through this process of identifying problem areas. And this was identified as one of the top problem areas, such that it was actually put in the transmission overlay district because it was that big of an issue. So we have been following kind of guidance that came out of a significant public process back in 2014 to, re to redo this. And we actually chose the site that the town identified as the best site for meeting this coverage while going next to existing development and trying to mini you know, minimize. And we've been able to come in at 100 feet, not 130. So we're hoping that the board sees that although there will be people that will object here, and if you, we came to you with a proposal to rebuild, you'd have 30 people in here saying, how tall is that? thing going to be, and they wouldn't like it either, but we have tried to kind of go where the town indicated and be responsible and try to actually minimize the impacts to the greatest extent possible. Uh, and, and I do agree with you that, um, you know, when, when there is, you know, the thoughts of putting, you know, you know, installing a tower like in a neighborhood, I know in my neighborhood, people came out in droves against it. Yeah. And that's probably why it wasn't even a no, well, I think it was identified as an area of need but I know there was a lot of pushback um, for putting one up there. But I, I would, I'm just wondering now, I mean, that was 2014. Maybe the town should revisit this whole, the whole thing. And I know this isn't the purview of this board, but. Um, Correct. I mean, everybody uses cell phones, you know? And, uh, and we've got, that's a technology, that's, that's where it's going. Um, uh, if it's not already there. So I don't know how we're going to resolve this to satisfy everybody's concerns. Um, well, and also, I don't want to overstate what you're doing tonight. I'd love, I mean, Nicholas was, you know, frustrated with the ordinance, but this is just part one. This is just, I think, the board concluding that there isn't another location, an existing tower or structure that we could be using. The board will still be looking at the height, the design, whether it's a monopine or monopole, what color is it? You know, there's gonna be buffering and, and that whole discussion will take place. So when you actually look at, all right, so now we've concluded that according to the ordinance, this is a place where a new tower can go. Now the planning board will look at what we proposed and how and where it's cited and that will be a whole other discussion, I think. So this is really, I think, just the initial vote to conclude that, you know, there isn't another thing we should go on um, that's there, and, and I think Nicholas, I think that I think the first step of the, of the ordinance actually requires us to look at towers, and then the, and Jake, correct me, but and then the next one is existing structures, and so we're definitely on the hook for any uh, cell phone tower, any other tower, a tall building, a church steeple, any structure that is in the area where we're trying to cover. We and which is why we looked at the inn and, and why we were asked to look at the, the church steeple. I think the ordinance requires us to jump through all those hoops, and I just think we're at the point where because there are no towers or tall structures in this area of town, um, that's why we're talking about a new tower in the, in the overlay district. So um, I think we did have to jump through those hoops and concluded that, but I don't know if Jay, if, 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 I'm, if I've got that wrong or you think I'm mischaracterizing that fact. Nope, it's the, the sort of uh, three layers or first three hurdles before you get to a new tower in the trans, uh, portation, uh, I'm sorry, trans, transmission tower overlay district are looking at existing transmission towers, which clearly we're discussing with the, with the fire barn. 
Um, the next one will be new transmission towers within the industrial or light industrial district. And then the third and sort of final um, approach is uh, new telecommunication facilities. And I think that's what you've addressed, and barring that the board finds that none of those three would work, then we would get into the, again, we already talked about, and I think it's at least worth echoing that even if the board does find that the priority of location is met, um, however you determine that this evening, there's still sort of a host of review criteria to go through in terms of buffering and uh, height and uh, setbacks and style of the poll. So there is um, still a bit more a bit more work to do even after priority of location, but certainly this is the first stage. So, so, so in terms of the location, I mean, based on everything I've, I've read, they meet that criteria. I'm done. <laughs> Period. That's your. Story. I just want to make sure I wasn't a question mark or. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call my own name, now if you don't if you don't mind. Um, just to pick up on some of that some of that conversation, and I think, um, you know, it is difficult as as Nick said at times when we are tasked with uh, enforcing an ordinance that is sometimes complex, may not be worded perfectly. And, you know, we, we could always talk or debate about whether there are ways to wordsmith things, but this is, the, this is the ordinance that we have. This is what we've been handed, and this is the ordinance and the, um, the process under which the applicant has been working. I think we would all agree in, in good faith to, to jump through these hoops and to um, try to satisfy those criteria. So um, I just want to... I just wanted to go on record saying that I, I think we, um, while we can always take issue with how, it, how an ordinance might be worded or how something might be maybe a little bit too ambiguous for our taste, um, I think we do have to sort of come back to what it is that we're tasked with doing. And at times we have to make some tough, sometimes unpopular decisions. And this one is a tough one for me, just like it is for I think everybody else. Uh, as I said last time, I spent a ton of time in the marsh. Um, I live in Pine Point. I have terrible AT&T service, just for the record. Um, and I have spent time volunteering in the marsh and on the beaches, sometimes with, alongside some of the people in this very room. Um, and so it's difficult. But I think when we look at the ordinance, and we look at, as I said last time, it, the ordinance really is uh, it's really an embodiment of a of a balancing act to try to direct try to direct um, the siting of these things to meet a perceived need uh, in a way that tries to um, tries to address some of these different concerns and and try to ensure that towers are not just going up willy nilly that there is a very deliberate process uh, and that the burden is on the applicant to demonstrate that they're not just taking the path of least resistance. Um, and, you know, there have been a lot of good comments from the public and from others about view corridors and wildlife uh, uh, threats and so forth, and I'm very sensitive to those, as I know everyone here is. Um, you know, if this does go forward, as has been, as has been stated, um, we have a whole other can of worms to go through in terms of setbacks and buffering and so forth. Uh, and sort of going back to the ordinance, uh, one thing that the ordinance does not say is that no tower should ever be visible. It just doesn't. Um, so we can do all sorts of buffering and landscaping and setbacks, but there will be times when you might be able to see it. Um, and that is, again, not there's nothing in the ordinance that says that towers have to be completely hidden so that no one ever sees them. And I know that someone made the point that two wrongs don't make a right. Um, but I think it is important to step back a little bit and just kind of reestablish some context. And again, I say this as someone who loves the marsh as much as anybody. When I'm down fly fishing in the marsh or canoeing or whatever, I see trains go across the marsh. I see the tower over at Scotto Hill. I see other buildings. I see the sanitary district building. That's not to say that we should be reckless in how we cite these things or that just because there are other uh, things that some people might consider to be visual blemishes that we, that anything goes. And I think to the contrary, this whole process is really intended to, to try to make sure that these things are 
handled in a much more thoughtful way. Um, but I, I guess my point is that I, I think it's possible through thoughtful um, review and design and buffering to, to have something like this and still be able to respect everything that the marsh represents. Um, so, you know, I know it's, it's a hard thing to say in a room filled with people who clearly don't agree, but um, I think based on the information that we've been given, including the, the peer review, and we generally do give quite a bit of deference to the town's peer reviewers, um, uh, I have no other conclusion than that the applicant has met the, the priority of location criteria. Um, I think for the record it, uh, that the applicant should provide the engineering, um, the engineering detail. Uh, I think it's important to the town and to everyone that you show your work uh, there. Um, but that's where I am on that. And again, uh, there's a lot of work still to be done in terms of buffering and um, and all the other things uh, that would need to be looked at in terms of performance standards. But that's where I am on it, and I'll hand it over to you. I've learned more about uh, transmission towers than I ever thought I would. Um, I must agree with my colleagues. Uh, I don't particularly like the uh, ordinance, but it is the ordinance. And I believe that the work that you have done has uh, provided me with enough information to, in, to believe that this is the, the priority site that's, that should be chosen. I'm going to have to have a lot of very difficult conversations with my colleagues. Uh, I'm on the Conservation Commission. And I'm pretty sure they're going to want to talk to me uh, about this vote. It's, it's not easy. But we follow the rules. We have to follow the guidelines. Uh, I think Verizon has made the effort and a good faith effort and has provided us with enough detail uh, to say that it meets the criteria. Thank you. Uh, so with that, I would suggest that we sort of table this item uh, for now and, again, have a whole host of other things to tackle. And be a lot more homework for the applicant to do, uh, but I think in the interest of um, just having a logical pause point on this item and being able to get to at least one more item on our agenda tonight, we'll table this for now and look be, to be continued. Great. Thank so you very thank much. You. Thanks again to everyone who came out. We have a minute for folks to transition out here. this far. All right, folks, we are going to move on to the ne next item on our agenda, so uh, just ask you to please uh, exit as quietly as you can. Thank you. Item number 12 on our agenda, Rosewood Land Development, Inc. requests a final subdivision review for 158 Payne Road, Assessor's Map R49, Lot 2. Jamel, are we back to you on this? We are. Right. Um, so, uh, this application is known as the Tucker Brook Conservation Subdivision. It's located on 158 Payne Road in the R2 Zoning District. Uh, 12 lot conservation subdivision proposal. The applicant uh, received preliminary approval, approval uh, back in June, uh, a few months ago, by the board. And Angela will speak to staff's remaining review comments for this project. Thanks. Um, there were only a couple things. Um, I think they've um, done a good job going through and, and working back and forth with staff um, and trying to address a lot of the concerns, one of which being really the water coming off the upper side of the project, really um, runoff from the neighboring neighborhood <laughs> coming um, through to this site. And so I know Sean has provided some grading um, showing a swale through there. <coughs> Um, unfortunately, it looked like there was some CAD difficulties, so we only got half the grading. That's one of the comments. Um, the second really comment is that 
that swale will have to be maintained in the future. So really, um, the easement that we were asking for for, uh, for the drainage easement really should be where the swale is located, which it isn't right now. So those are the two, um, I guess, remaining comments that I had. Um, other than that, I think that we've done a good job going back and forth, and so we'd have to review whatever the, the rest of the grading looks like, because I know um, one of the things the board had talked about was trying to get the uh, post-development peak flow rates down to at or below pre-development, and Sh Sean was looking at redirecting some of those <coughs> lots. Um, I'm trying to think of what I'm about. <coughs> on the stream side of um, the project, so really there's a, there's a lot of gradings. You see it's a pretty steep slope, so there's going to be a lot of grading that needs to happen through there to redirect it, and so staff will really want to um, go through that and make sure that that's directed as intended to meet the stormwater design. So that's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Frank, do you have anything to add? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sean Frank with Sebago Technics. Uh, with me tonight is Joe Fustacci of Rosewood Land Development. Um, no quick and easy. If, uh, if the board is comfortable, uh, we would uh, ask for a conditional approval. Uh, we'd be more than happy, obviously, to sit down with the town engineer um, I do have the grading for those lower lots. Again, I understand that, you know, obviously this is grading based upon some assumptions in terms of building size and those types of things, but do have the specifics uh, in terms of making sure that the runoff from those lower <coughs> lots uh, gets directed to the stormwater pond, which, as you may recall, was the whole issue in terms of making sure we didn't have additional peak rates of runoff coming off from the site. Um, and the other part is in terms of the grading associated with those upper lots, obviously I can adjust those as well. Again, just like you meet with uh, Angela one more time, if I could. Certainly appreciate staff's time. Uh, they've been very, uh, uh, very willing to, to, to meet with us in terms of working out some of those details. I really do think it's just down to the, some grading details to make sure we have the water going exactly where we want it to. I'm more than willing to work uh, with the town engineer to make sure we have that all worked out. And again, if the board is comfortable, we would appreciate a, a conditional final approval tonight, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with that, we'd certainly be happy to answer any questions the board has. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we do have a draft uh, motion for conditional approval here that I think addresses the, the loose ends, but if anyone has any questions or comments. I, I have a question. Uh, Sean, on um, the second page of your, uh, what is it, August 31st letter to Jamil, you mentioned the treatment pond um, as providing a potential amenity to the subdivision. Could you? Explain that a little bit. It's just that it's it, the treatment pond is a permanent pool, uh, so it's uh, and again I understand these aren't the beaut most beautiful things in the world, but I hate the uh, uh, underdrained soil filters. To be honest with you, I think those are even more ugly when it comes right down to it. So at least it's a pool, a pond, you know, with water um, that certainly will freeze up in the winter. So you know, skating if you will within the winter months. Uh, you look down at Dunstan Crossing, they actually, you know, they kind of built a little park area around it and they uh, put a, a, a fountain in it and those types of things. So, you know, there are those types of possibilities that, you know, that it can at least be made part of the neighborhood, if you will, rather than just, you know, the, the utilitarian uh, 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 treatment pond, if you will. All right, thank you. Thanks. Anyone down here? Roger has Roger. questions. <laughs> I was wondering about the hammerhead. Uh, remember, we discussed this, Roger, last time, because it's not just the space and bulk requirements of the uh, uh, of the 100 feet of frontage, if you will, with 20,000 square foot lots, but actually making sure we had passing soils there, too, that met the 15 inches requirement for the subsurface sewage disposal systems. So those lots, if you will, are pretty much where they have to be in terms of us being able to get the 12. As you may recall, we actually had 14 originally. Um, we went down to 12 lots that did at least alleviate the uh, driveway, which was going to lot eight. So we did minimize some of the wetland impacts associated with that. Um, but, you know, flipping the, the public works likes the hammerhead on the right rather than on the left. Obviously, if we extend the road down a little bit more, that even gets us into worse wetlands rather than better. Uh, and we really can't pull it back at all, like I say, because it's really based more upon the soils to get the passing soils out there for the subsurface sewage disposal system. So uh, we believe we have done everything to try to minimize the wetland impacts associated with the development. I will point out is, again, that, you know, uh, it's a 20-acre site. Uh, over 12 of that will be retained as, as undeveloped. Um, it really, we are just trying to, to, uh, to develop, you know, the area that is uh, most, 
you know, so the, the easiest to develop <coughs> from a hub standard building standpoint. Okay. I guess I'm all set. Okay. Thank you. All set. Yeah, I uh, I don't have any additional questions. I think the brief recap and the responses you just provided pretty well pretty well covers things. So, with that, I'll uh, put this motion forward. Uh, I move to approve the project titled Tuckerbrook Subdivision, proposed by Rosewood Land Development LLC, as depicted on the plan set prepared by Sebago Technics, dated August 31st, 2018, with the following findings and conditions. Findings as stated herein. Conditions, number one, prior to the signing and release of the Mylar, the plan, shall, plan set shall be revised to address the following. A, provide the specific location and species of the proposed street trees on the grading plan. B, realign the drainage <coughs> easement to encompass the proposed swale on lots 10, 11, and 12, as noted in the staff review comments memorandum dated September 17, 2018. And C, provide a lot grading plan for all 12 lots in the subdivision. Condition number two, prior to the release of the Mylar, the applicant shall execute and record the maintenance agreement as required by the post-construction stormwater management ordinance. Number three, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall pay the traffic impact fees. Number four, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall pay the recreation contribution fees. And number five, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town <coughs> staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. Second. That's the motion. We have a second. Any discussion? All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And item 13, m and Holdings LLC requests a final subdivision review for Crossroads Plan Development District, Phase 1, Assessor's Map R52, Lot 4. Again, this is final subdivision review. Jamel? All right. Uh, so as the board knows, the applicant's proposing a subdivision for the entire Phase 1 site in the Crossroads Plan Development Zoning District. Uh, the lots, the project includes 30 single family lots, redevelopment lots, and associated open space. So tonight's review will include the division of the lots for the phase one development. Uh, I'd like to remind the board that the applicant did receive preliminary subdivision <coughs> approval in June 2018, a few months ago. Uh, following final subdivision approval, the applicant will then provide individual subdivision and or site plan applications uh, for the remaining uh, development lots on the site. So if you recall, that's lots two, three, and four for this phase. Uh, so a few comments to go through. Uh, the applicant has noted that a total of 13 affordable housing units will be included in the project as requ required by the zoning standards. Uh, they have noted that they are coordinating with the housing authority uh, on finalizing this and should discuss this process with the board. The applicant has indicated that the phase one development is not anticipated to have a significant impact on the operation of the Route 1 and Payne Road intersections uh, with Scarborough Downs Road. Uh, given the size of the proposed development, uh, the impacts and the impacts that it eventually will have on Route 1 and the Payne Road corridors, uh, the applicant should discuss with the board when they anticipate making improvements to these intersections. Uh, staff has had discussions with the applicant regarding the maintenance and ownership of some of the unique amenities, such as the landscape boulevards and stormwater treatment facilities uh, proposed to become public within the right-of-way of Scarborough Downs Road. So the ap applicant and staff are currently working on a memorandum of understanding, or MOU, to help facilitate this process. The applicant should discuss the proposed design along with the timing and construction phasing for the Scarborough Downs Road and also what is envisioned for the transition area uh, of the roadway. The town's attorney has reviewed the cross easement agreement and the declaration of covenant documents provided with the submission and there appears to be, to be missing language in regards to allowing public access to the pedestrian infrastructure and open space. And staff encourages the applicant to include this language that allows for uh, public use of these features. There are, appears to be an opportunity to provide additional outdoor seating areas along the pedestrian pathways and streets within the development. So the applicant should be sure to discuss these areas with the board. 
And finally, the applicant should provide the board with an update on their status of their main DEP uh, permit. And there's lots of other uh, staff and peer review comments that we provided, and these are just the highlights. So that's what I have now. Thanks. Yep. And I will hand it off to Mr. Bacon. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jamal, and thank you, Planning Board. Um, we've been before you a number of times uh, in regards to aspects of this project as was introduced. Uh, this is really the framework final subdivision uh, plan for the initial phase in, in the Scarborough Downs project. Um, so this is really designed to uh, seek approval for the new Downs Road right-of-way, converting uh, the existing driveway of the Downs Road um, and access drive into uh, a formal public right-of-way and then providing access to the, uh, the three larger lots, which we will be back before you uh, for site plan and or subdivision review, which are uh, shown on the plan uh, at the bottom that shows the layouts of those, and then for uh, review and approval of the 30 new single family house lots that would be accessed off of Grist Mill Lane, which is the residential street off of the Downs Road. So um, this is really the first step. Uh, the next steps would be the, the additional uh, review for those other three lots, which we anticipate being um, at one of your next meetings um, or next meeting. Um, we've been working closely with staff. Uh, at this point, uh, there are a handful of, um, I would say, more kind of minor items to, to finalize. Um, we're working through the MOU around um, what's the responsibility of the association in terms of the, the landscaped Downs Road in the median, which won't be the responsibility of public works, um, as well as the uh, maintenance of the stormwater facilities uh, within the right-of-way and snow removal for the on-street parking spaces that are uh, on the Downs Road and on proposed on Grist Mill Lane, which you've seen in the past. Um, in addition, we have some minor updates to the, to the uh, engineering around the stormwater system, and we'll certainly work with staff to finalize those. Um, as was noted around the affordable housing, um, we're proposing to provide a mix of rental and home ownership affordable units and uh, the coordination with the Housing Alliance has been ongoing because the program is uh, still being shaped around the home ownership affordable units and will comply with um, what is the final program as agreed to with the Housing Alliance. Uh, there is a, a program in place for the rental units that we've done on other projects and can, can easily <coughs> comply with. So we're committed to meeting the requirement and committed to having a mix of home ownership and rental affordable units. Um, in terms of the traffic and uh, traffic review, our traffic engineer has been working with the peer review engineer. Uh, I think we've come to agreement around the impact fees and satisfying the other comments in the traffic review. In terms of the phasing of intersection improvements um, at Route 1, um, for this initial phase, there'll be some minor kind of timing improvements made based on uh, the proposed trip generation out of, out of the site. And, um, and at Payne Road and the Downs Road slash existing driveway, um, the intention is to make, uh, likely make off-site improvements and improvements to that intersection really with the next phase of development, which is going to be on that end of the project, um, which we've started to review with the board through the site inventory analysis phase of the master planning uh, for that area. So that will be, those improvements will be made as part of that, uh, that light industrial phase that's coming for the board in the near future. The Route 1 uh, Downs intersection improvements are likely when um, the road is connected up to, uh, say, Haggis Parkway and to Payne Road. So um, that the exact timing of that is really going to be based on collaboration with the town and main DOT when a traffic movement permit is triggered. They're not uh, warranted at this phase of the project beyond the timing improvements that I mentioned. Um, I think in terms of other items that were brought up by staff, um, public access to trails and open space. Um, we certainly have a kind of robust trail system plan for the overall project. And, and can provide public access to 
to the trails within um, this initial phase. <coughs> there are amenities uh, planned within the open space within the neighborhood. Um, so I think we need to work on kind of the, the logistics of uh, public use of what's really kind of neighborhood kind of play area that's designed for the single family uh, neighborhood. Um, but we can work with staff on what the public access allowances uh, look like for that. Um, and I think those are the bulk of the staff comments, but um, certainly can clarify any other questions the board has at this time. Um, we'd be interested in approval this evening, really, um, to enable us to come back for lots one, two, and three, uh, which you'd be reviewing under subdivision site plan at your, uh, at, at a subsequent meeting, at which time we also can confirm compliance with, you know, uh, making the adjustments the staff's recommending in the staff report. Um, I think DEP permit was one of the other staff comments. Um, we've been coordinating with DEP and the DEP permit is um, scheduled to be issued on October 9th or before. So that's the status of the DEP permit. All right. Thank you. Um, before we turn to board discussion, I will just quickly say something that will probably make me even less popular than I already feel right now, which is that um, it's <laughs> almost 1030 and it looks, appears likely that we're not going to get to any agenda items beyond this one. So we can't take up anything after 1030. So just wanted to put that out there. You're welcome to stay. Uh, but that's the outlook. So with that, um, Rachel, did you have anything on this? Yeah. Um, I find it. And first thing I have to say is basically because I'm an English teacher, uh, I would point out that on the cross easement agreement, uh, there's a reference there to um, a Scottish delicacy made out of sheep's intestines rather than um, Haggis Parkway. There's a spelling mistake. It's Haggis. You've got down Haggis Parkway, which is a Scottish delicacy. So you might want to uh, double check the spelling. Then... Um, mention that to our attorney. Hmm? We'll mention that to our attorney. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. As I said, uh, as an English teacher, that immediately strikes, strikes me. Um, I, I, just a, an update on the uh, agreement. Um, any, any agreement has been reached on the computer, the, the com commuter, it is like commuter breeze bus service or anything. You did mention that, that you're, you're working on that. Any We've been update? coordinating with uh, not only breeze but the other bus providers um, and actually had a meet, meeting scheduled for tomorrow to talk about service in general to the downs. Um, I think I'd, defer to staff around their view of the use of the impact fee for that. Where that's what we'd um, like to see or would support, but um, staff and the board need to make that decision. As you go along, is there any thought for a, a bus stop in the Downs area any anywhere that along here? Um, uh, and along with that, would there be any sort of um, a bus shelter? We're planning to have the ability to add a shelter later based on ridership, um, but the, the plan is to have a bus stop at least one location um, in this phase of the project and in conversations with uh, the transit providers, they may actually loop through um, this phase and then into Enterprise Business Park mm -hmm. and then out, um, at least in the southbound movement, given the connection we're gonna provide to the neighboring business park. Okay. and. Um no, I think this was answered. All right. Thank you. Nick? Uh, I don't have a whole lot to add. It looks like reading through the draft motion and staff comments and the presentation, almost everything is pretty thoroughly covered here as far as loose ends. So I don't have a whole else, a lot else to add. I see some highlighting on there. <laughs> <laughs> I have 15 questions. <laughs> no, but I, I was looking at the draft motion also and, you know, looking at the staff reports uh, or comments. I uh, just ask, ask you a couple of questions about the, um, the public link to the municipal campus. Did you just mention anything about that? 
I didn't, I apologize. Um, we've been attempting to coordinate with uh, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife for a while. Um, and I, it's been, they've had a busy summer, so we haven't connected since early summer um, to talk further about their openness to, to have the conservation land that the state owns be improved on with a trail. Um, we're not gonna give up, but we haven't had success in the last couple months of reaching now. So, um, you know, maybe if we try a two-pronged approach in, in working with staff and, and together we can provide some outreach to them to try to get to a solution on that. We're, we're open to making that improvement. It's just a matter of getting the state to go along with it. Okay, um, and the, the other, um, the next, the next um, bullet was uh, regarding the additional outdoor seating. Actually, I, I couldn't quite find out where that open space area three was. So, open space area three is, it's in the center of the grist mill lane loop. So okay. it's okay. behind many of the single family houses. Um, in this part of the project, it's also shown down, down here. Um, and it's in this location and the trails within uh, particularly the, oh. the single family neighborhood all lead to it. Um, and so there's benches that are proposed on the perimeter, like at the crosswalks of Grist Mill Lane. Um, and I think staff's suggesting there be benches within the park or within that open space. And we're open to adding additional seating. There's, because um, it's designed as like a natural playscape. So there's boulders and there's logs and uh, things of that nature that are fun for kids to use, um, but also low maintenance. Um, but we certainly can look at adding a few seating, um, you know, a few benches for seating. Okay, and the last, just the last thing is on the uh, very last page of the comments regarding the, um, for clarity of records, the notes on lots one and two. Uh, is that, are those part of the conditions? Do you have them in here? I didn't see them in there. They can be added. Nope, they're there. It's uh, condition 1B. Okay, all right, I'm all done. All right, no rush. Thanks, Roger. Um, I think things have been pretty well covered here. Again, what we're voting on <coughs> this evening is, we're considering this evening is uh, just creating the lots, it's the, the subdivision, and there's plenty of other detail that we, that's been touched on that we can certainly get into going forward um, from, uh, you know, stormwater details, inspection ports, and all kinds of fun mm -hmm. things that we can drill down on. Um, but I'm comfortable, because I think my colleagues are, uh, for purposes of subdivision of approval for, for phase one here. Um, and I think we, we do have a fairly lengthy list of conditions that address the, the various loose ends here, none of which I think rise to, you know, a big threshold issue. So um, with that, I move to approve the project titled Subdivision Plan, Plan Development Area, proposed by m &R Holdings, LLC, as depicted on the plan set prepared by Goral Palmer, dated August 31st, 2018, with the following findings and conditions. Findings as stated. Conditions, number one, prior to the release of the Mylar, the plan set <coughs> shall be revised to address the following. A, provide additional outdoor seating areas along the pedestrian pathways and within open space area three, Scarborough Downs Road and Grist Mill Lane. B, provide the yard setbacks for lots 4.1 to 4.3 on the overall subdivision plan. C, relocate the transformers to outside the right-of-ways and designate the appropriate easements. D, provide the required plan notes on the overall subdivision plan as noted in the staff review comments memorandum dated September 17, 2018. And 1E, provide a detail for the sloped granite curb, concrete tip down and grist mill lane cross section at the trail crossings. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Condition number two, prior to the release of the Mylar, the applicant shall A, address the traffic peer review comments on the memorandum dated September 9th, 2018, uh, by Traffic Solutions. 
B, provide a memorandum of understanding identifying the maintenance and ownership responsibilities of the amenities located within the public right-of-ways on the site. C, execute and record the maintenance agreement as required by the post-construction stormwater management ordinance. 2D, revise the cross-easement agreement and declaration of covenants documents to include language that allows for public access to the pedestrian infrastructure and open space on the site. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. Condition number three, in accordance with the affordable housing requirements in the Crossroads Plan Development District, 13 affordable housing units are to be provided in accordance with the schedule established on note number 11 at the approved plan, six units on lot one, four units on lot two, and three of the single family lots shown on lots 4.1 to 4.3. Number four, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall pay the traffic impact fees. Five, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall pay the recreation contribution fees. Number six, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall provide A, approval from the Scarborough Sanitary District, and B, approval by the main DEP. Number seven, the applicant shall perform an assessment of the traffic at the Route 1 Scarborough Downs and Payne Road Scarborough Downs Road signalized intersections after the build out of phase one is completed. Number eight, prior to the issue, prior to the start of construction, the applicant shall provide a construction sequencing and phasing plan for the entire phase one subdivision, including designated laydown areas. This shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department. And condition number nine, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer, and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. That's unanimous. Thank you. Can I ask a question real quick? On the traffic impact fees around transit, was that, are we paying the impact fees or? Yeah, so. For OCAL? Yes. We're, um, so the assistant town manager working at the, at the request of the town manager is working on a program. Um, and so at this point, we're going to have the Oak Hill mitigation fee just paid to the fund. But we are looking at a provision that will come to council as to utilizing those to, to essentially maximize. But we can't commit those funds directly. That's really going to be a council action. So um, staff is on board with the direction we're headed. But we are just going to have you pay to the mitigation fund. Great. Thanks for the clarification. We're Thank serious. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for waiting. We'll see you again on October 1st. <laughs> the next <Yes>. phase. <laughs> All right. As mentioned, due to time constraints, uh, items number 14, 15, and 16 were tabled. Um, appreciate everyone's understanding on that and uh, the fact that they waited around. Um, item number 17, do we have a staff report? I have a few things, do you? I have a few as well, you go first. <laughs> it's nice that it's not 11.30 this time, oh. so maybe I'll All say right. the correct thing. Um, so, as the board knows, I try, our staff tried to coordinate a site walk as requested by the board for the Ridgewood Farm subdivision. Um, it didn't seem to work this time but, um, in terms of coordinating, so I'm sort of just wondering what the best way schedule these site visits are and if you guys are still interested in, in doing one for that site. This is the one on Brennan Road? Correct. So it's sort of a two-pronged question, but we can start with are you interested in still doing one? I suppose. Oh, it's it's tight. I'm not hearing you. I recall, I recall the, uh, the abutters on, on the next road up. They had a lot of concerns about this, this project. So, I'm not familiar with the area myself. Okay. Yeah, I would suggest let's try at least one more time to get something going. Do you like yeah. the drop the doodle poll format, or would you yeah. like me to just email you or call you individually, or what? <laughs> doodle what? Poll, the doodle poll works for me. Yeah. Okay. Hunt us down one by I know one. we were asking a lot lately, so yeah. it's, I sort of feel bad asking. I will say, I, at times in the past, we've done site walks immediately prior to or a little bit before a, a planning board meeting on a day on a day or an evening when people are already sort of planning to be doing 
planning board related things. That may not work for everyone, but I suspect, you know, we, we kind of ran into the dog days of summer on yeah. this last one too. And, Just a little bit. Um, it's sometimes hard to get the stars aligned. What, what's, your, what's your thoughts on the site block for this? Um, I think it's worth doing if we can get a critical mass of people who can make it. And then I guess the second question, is the doodle poll uh, an effective method for folks? Or is uh, just a, a group email better? With a doodle poll. I, I think doodle yeah. works because you can also see yeah. where others start. what works for other people. Yeah. Why don't we just find the people who don't respond? Retry. <laughs> we'll, dock, we'll dock your next meeting's pay. <laughs> yeah, we can only do so much. <laughs> so I'll shoot for, I'll, uh, I'll try and work on that. Try and um, try again. Either for maybe October 1 or October 9. Sorry for that. Okay, and then the next one I just want to remind the board of the master plan workshop for the Scarborough Downs Phase 2 project is scheduled for October 1st, 2018 at 6 p.m. right here in Chambers A. And thank, thank you for agreeing to come to another meeting. We appreciate it. That's all I have. All right. well, thank you. While you're reminding them of meetings, I'll remind them of meeting this coming Wednesday. Uh, we're going to have a joint hearing with the council starting at 7 p.m. Uh, you, this item is the first item, first act, real actionable item, I guess I'll say. You know, there's always minutes and the other perfunctory type stuff, but uh, on the council agenda, and it is going to be a joint workshop on the contract zone uh, proposal by Clearview Condominiums. Um, so much like last time, there'll probably be tables sort of set up right here in front. We'll all sit around and go through that process. We've shared with you the... Uh, materials through Dropbox. Uh, we know that uh, Roger cannot attend. Nick is late. late at best, it sounds like, depending on how other things go. So, um, Rachel and Corey, I know I already touched base with you, so um, I'll be sure to just reach out, be sure we have at least two other members from the board. Um, and I think we already had those commitments anyway, but I'll just be reaffirming those. Um, and then I guess the only other thing I want to remind folks is the comprehensive plan review process is underway. We have that first draft. It's been out now two months. I think we're almost to the day. Um, still collecting comments. Long range planning committees really um, has gone through sort of their own review process. Now they want to start to, they're going to start really taking a look at what all those review comments are and finding the themes and threads there. And, making any suggested changes uh, before any recommendations, formal recommendations are made to council. Um, so then I guess there's two other things I want to make mention of. Uh, today was the first day uh, uh, for Doreen uh, Kreese, who started in the planning department as our new uh, administrative secretary. Um, so at her next meeting, she'll be taking the minutes. Todi, thank you in your office for <laughs> stepping up. Uh, in, in, in these uh, last month or so uh, since Karen left us. But we're really excited to have Doreen on, on board and uh, think she's going to be a great addition. Uh, I didn't feel quite right asking her on her first day to stick around till 11 o'clock. So. <laughs> <laughs> but next time I won't feel so bad. So, um, And then the last thing I'm going to make note of is the Appointments Committee, uh, Susan Oglis, as you all know, has wanted to get off the board for a while and has agreed to stay on until Appointments Committee could find someone. And um, Appointments Committee, sort of unbeknownst to staff, was able to, had, had an application uh, come before them. And so uh, Susan Oglis, actually her first, her last official meeting will be with us on the 19th, uh, next Wednesday. Um, and then she will be off the board. Um, but I will um, certainly want to reach out the, and extend the invitation normally at the end of the year. We always do a sort of end of the year workshop, sort of gathering of the board. And so I will be certainly uh, offering, extending the offer for her to come to that meeting so we can uh, say goodbye to her uh, as, as she should be. Um, so those are the items that I had on my list. And I also wanted Thanks. to thank Tody for working with us and filling in these last few months. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Andrew, did you have anything to add this time around? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I don't think we had any administrative amendments. Not this time around. No? Okay. As far as I know. All right. Uh, any correspondence to report beyond everything that we've got related to Verizon? All right. Planning board comments. You don't have a transportation update for us, Roger? No. No? We haven't had a meeting, have we? Yeah, we reviewed the comments. <laughs> oh, <my goodness>. <laughs> <laughs> Roger had a great comment. Remember that? <laughs> Remember how good your comments were? I'm not taking up any Let the record show that 30. Roger had excellent <laughs> comments. On You'll see all of the uh, transportation comments, excellent. lots of them, yeah. right. along range planners. They're all quoted. Right? Great. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, I mean, that, that's an important thing to note is, you know, uh, Jay mentioned that the Long Range Planning Committee had been reviewing and providing comments on the new comp plan, but the various other town committees have weighed in as well. And between that and all the public outreach and the public events and the survey that, that was done, um, I think, I think uh, it's really maximized the amount of participation. So look forward to seeing that get, get uh, flushed out. Any other planning board comments? Uh, I just want to mention the Conservation Commission still would like to have some sort of a workshop with the planning board. Uh, the, the concern that the commission has is around um, conservation developments. Uh, there was some interest in, on the part of the commissioners in reviewing any um, proposals for a conservation subdivision first. Um, I referenced the schedule that would have to be kept if that was what they wanted to do. Uh, and there's still some interest in, in doing that. There was some confusion or some discussion about um, times long before I came, uh, which was that the, planet, that the Conservation Commission did do some review, um, but nobody could exactly remember what that was. So um, I think it's, it's worthwhile holding that sort of a, a joint meeting. Um, I think both the Conservation Commission and the Planning Board uh, should among themselves be really clear what the purpose would be and, and what possible outcomes we might be looking for. Um, there remains considerable concern that the Planning Board is not paying enough attention to conservation issues. And it may be a problem for ordinance. Uh, I think uh, if anybody takes a look at the um, what we passed tonight, allowing cutting of the trees, sooner or later somebody on that conservation commission is going to get highly upset about that. And um, I think we need just to kind of flesh out how we approach either as the both the commission and and the planning board how we're going to approach uh, it, the issues as it gets tougher and tougher to find good land. Jamel, were you there? Oh, I was. Yes. Okay. If, do you want to? Was I reasonably fair? That was a good uh, recap of the discussion. I'd also like to add that I think uh, coordination between the Planning Board and the Conservation Commission will be an agenda item at the upcoming Commission meeting. So we'll discuss it further and hopefully come up with a, a solid plan going forward. Okay. And and I think we'll probably have a split staff at that meeting. One of us will, because that is on the same night as this board meeting. So mm -hmm. oh, uh, I'll right. probably be attending the Conservation Commission as I know some of that history. Uh, yes, and, and I'll be here at this meeting. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you luck. Yeah. <clears throat> Can I just make a comment about mm -hmm. about that conservation sub uh, subdivisions? Uh, I found it kind of interesting since I've been on this board. Uh, we had a development on Mitchell Hill Road, I think it was, and where, um, and also, I'm not sure whether it was Payne Road, Mitchell Hill Road, and, and I think there's Brenham, Brenham Road one is also. And, and we've had the neighbors who live in those areas, they live on like multiple acres of land, their, their plots are on multiple acres of land. And I understand the reasons behind the conservation subdivision, um, but there seems to be some discontent among the, uh, you know, abutters 
that all of a sudden their open space, their, their houses on large lots, there's going to be, their neighbors are going to be kind of s squeezed together, you know. I just wonder if there's ever been any discussion about the, the consequences of that, of the ordinance, you know. <coughs> yeah, I, I just would make the point, as, as I think we often do when we have those types of items in front of us, is that conservation subdivision can't be done anywhere where a conventional subdivision could not also be built. So you may have differences in, in, the, in the character, and it, that's sometimes what we hear, um, that sometimes there's a, some discomfort with people who are accustomed to living in sort of a more rural area, and it's not even so much the number of homes that might get built, but the perceived density and the kind of what they think is gonna be a different character. And that's, you know, that's an interesting discussion to have sometime, um, but I think, you know, there are, um, again, sort of, you know, not to go back to the, the uh, transmission uh, <coughs> tower, tower discussion, but I think it's another instance where we have some provisions that, you know, an ordinance that, portion of the ordinance that's aimed at striking a balance and achieving a policy outcome that's not perfect, and, you know, particularly as more, as, you know, more of the upland is developed, it's pushing things into more kind of marginal areas at times. Yeah. So, but it is an interesting discussion. Yeah, I, I just think when people have lived in these areas or have moved purposely to live, I mean, that's one of the things that came up in the comp plan. People, one thing about Scarborough is the, the diversity of where mm -hmm. people could live, you know, and mm -hmm. people buy land like two or five acres because they want to have a house there. But again, the, the, this, the, Conservation subdivision is not, it's not a variance, it's not relief, it's something that's available as of right in the, in the ordinance, mm. provided that you meet the requirements for it. So it's not as if it's a case of someone coming in and just unilaterally, you know, unilaterally changing and arbitrarily changing the zoning. That's not to say I'm not sympathetic with those reactions, it's totally understandable, but, um, I think it's a point that we do have to periodically reiterate that it, it is something that is it is part of the of the of the ordinance. So um, it's part of the underlying zoning, and and you know anyone who is buying in, in, in those areas as they would anywhere uh, have the opportunity to research that. And yeah. but again, that doesn't that doesn't. That's not to take away at all from that understandable reaction when things change like that. And it's sort of interesting, as you said, it's about sort of striking that balance. And you know, when that was implemented, that was the idea of how are you going to preserve the rural character? Is it sort of taking all 10 acres and having it be basically be on lawn area? Or is it preserving at least five mm -hmm. acres of those as undeveloped, um, cohesive, or uh, contiguous five acres of wooded area? reducing sort of the impervious area of roads, reducing the amount of lawn area that you have. So it is sort of the reduction on the impacts of the natural resource, but it does, to your point, can have that perceived just to look at it that, oh, this is a denser development, there, there's more happening here, when actually it's conserving more open space and conserving more of those sort of natural resources. Right. So it's, that that's, but I think no you know, silver I, under too. I understand what you're saying, Corey. But I, I still think, it, like that development on Mitchell Hill Road, where they're gonna, I think, have nine or ten lots mm -hmm. right there together. I mean, that is almost totally out of character of that mm -hmm. whole area. So, mm -hmm. just just a thought, an observation, I should say. Okay. Uh, I'll just make one more quick comment, building on what Rachel was saying about having a joint workshop that reminds me of the joint workshop that the planning board had with a few weeks ago or maybe it was over a month ago now with the zoning board of appeals um, and the town's attorney um, it was a good opportunity to go through some of the nuts and bolts of you know planning board responsibilities and and discretion and all that but it also was just a good opportunity to get to spend a little bit of time with kind of a sister board, if you will, and uh, understand there were a couple of aha moments in both directions when people realized, okay, so that's what you do, and that's what you're looking for, 
you know, when, when you send in an, an opinion to us. And I think, you know, it could be something similar with the Conservation Commission to help each other better understand what our constraints are and how we operate and, and what we're, what each entity might be looking for from the other. So I think that would be something that would be good to do. So any other planning board comments? All right, I move to adjourn. Second. In favor? Thank you. 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 Thank you.